Welcome to Nimmin Live, the number one place on the internet to learn about YouTube, network with other content creators, and have an awesome time doing it. My name is Nick, and today I'll be answering your YouTube questions. Um, D has a stream with Daniel Patel later today where they are going to be looking at YouTube channels and doing channel reviews, so you definitely want to make sure that you're around for that. And Daryl Eves also has a live stream that he's going to be doing today as well. So if you are, you know, uh, wanting to just like jam pack yourself with YouTube, knowledge today it's a good day for that but i have links to everybody down in the description of course for those particular streams but i do want to let you know um if you are just joining us if this is your first time here that uh during the stream i answer your youtube questions you can ask anything about what it is that you're trying to do on youtube anything you're trying to accomplish anything about you know being a content creator video editing, anything. Like if you're having trouble with something, I'm here to help. So all you have to do is there is a form down in the description of the video, or you can go to nicknimmon.com slash ask, and it will redirect you to this form. And all you have to do is put your question into that form, and I answer them in the order that they are received. I cleared it right before the stream started, so because of that, there's only three questions in there right now. So if you get your question in there, it will get answered on the stream today. Um, I also wanna let you know, Last stream, uh, last week, didn't stream, uh, you know, here on the channel. I actually went on vacation. I was in Japan, a uh, pretty cool trip. We went to Tokyo as my, my girlfriend and I, we went to Tokyo. Um, we were there for a handful of days, did some really cool stuff there. Uh, then we went to Kyoto, Japan, and uh, that was also really awesome. The time that we went, the cherry blossoms were coming out, which was great. So, so uh, what I what I read was that cherry blossoms basically they have about a week or so of bloom time, and then they are in full bloom for about a week or so, and then after that they start kind of slowly, you know, the leaves start falling off and all that stuff. But we landed and got in there right at. Um, right as everything was coming into full bloom. And then by the time we left, the cherry blossoms were just starting to go away. Um, it just slowly, you know, falling off. But it was absolutely fantastic. We had a really, really good time. And uh, I got engaged. So uh, so now she's not my girlfriend anymore. She's my fiance. So, uh, you know, so I got engaged. So that's just some big personal news that I wanted to share. And um, I haven't shared it on like Twitter or anything like that. I've shared it with some friends, you know, behind the scenes. Um, but I haven't, uh, you know, said anything publicly yet. But I just wanted to, you know, say it to you guys first. And um, and then you all probably make some tweets and stuff like that, you know, down the road. <laughs> but super excited. It was awesome. So basically, um, we went to this, uh, you know, temple area. It was in Kyoto. And um, they actually have the option to where you can dress up as a as a geisha there and it's a really popular thing for people to do so she dressed up as a geisha and we got her like a full you know geisha outfit and she's walking around like you know a lot of the other you know tourists that are doing the same thing and uh it was nighttime and we were you know walking around looking at stuff and there's these areas where they have the sakuras lit up at nighttime and we were walking down one of those streets and then I was like, man, this is like perfect right here. And then, you know, dropped the question, of course, but super romantic. It was awesome. Um, but yeah, so I'm engaged now. Um, so thank you for the congratulations here uh, in the chat. Super appreciate it. And uh, yeah, super excited myself as well. We haven't set an actual date for like the wedding or anything, but uh, but yeah, it's it's we're, you know, we're, we're halfway there, right? So uh, yeah, super cool. But anyway, just wanted to share that. Um, another thing that I wanted to let you know um, is that, uh, Vid Summit, for those of you that are planning to go to changing subjects here now, uh, Vid Summit is coming up. We are about five months away now from Vid Summit. So if you are somebody that is looking to go to Vid Summit this year, which is something that I really recommend if you are somebody that is taking your YouTube channel seriously, or you want to take it to the next level, or you want to start like a creator business around your channel, something like that. Um, Vid Summit is where serious content creators go, people that are, you know, trying to do this seriously to learn from the best. Um, so you know, the best content creators uh, on the platform are there and they share their information, you know, on stages, you can talk to everybody in the hallways. It's not like some of the other events where they kind of rope everybody off, um, but it's an awesome event. I'm going to be going and I really recommend that if you are somebody that is taking your channel seriously, that you also check out Vid Summit. but you can find information for Vid Summit. Chantel just dropped the link here in the chat um, at vidsummit.com. I've also got links down in the description if you are watching on YouTube or any platform that allows for, uh, you know, video description links. Um, but if not, then just head over to vidsummit.com. 
But uh, let's see here. So I got the streams covered. I got Vid Summit covered. I've got the engagement covered. So let's get into the content. Let's go ahead and start answering some. Uh, let's go ahead and start answering some YouTube questions. Get into uh, you know the 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 thing here and um, and start doing that whole thing. Um, yeah, Shark Scrapper right here says Vid Summit is awesome. Uh, recommended so much energy, learning, and sharing. Absolutely, I come back fully charged every time I go. I absolutely, absolutely love it. Uh, Chatty Kathy, thank you so much. Yeah, again, thank you everybody for the congratulations. Yeah, I was like, uh, I was like, man, should I? should I share this out on like Twitter or something? Or should I save it for a live stream? I was like, yeah, let's save it for a live stream. <laughs> oh, but super excited. Yeah, we're, we're both, uh, you know, really excited about it. So it's gonna be fun. So the very first question that we have to get us uh, get us on track today. Oh, you know what? I haven't done the other uh, things yet either. Uh, so I do want to let everybody know that this stream is brought to you by TubeBuddy, which is the number one tool for YouTube content creators. Um, TubeBuddy will help you optimize your videos for discovery. Um, they have a bunch of AI tools now that will help you in different ways, like you know, writing titles and things like that. Um, they have A/B testing for your thumbnails, so you can test your thumbnails to make sure that your thumbnails are effective for the people that you are trying to reach with your content and for the traffic sources that you're trying to reach as well. Um, one of the things that people say when I mention TubeBuddy is they'll say, well, TubeBuddy, or, uh, YouTube is rolling out the A-B testing feature for content creators already, so why use TubeBuddy's A-B testing tool? And my answer to that is with YouTube's, you get the you know recommendations and they only show you watch time, right? So with the recommendations, what I mean is they are swapping your thumbnails out um, you know, per viewer, and it's actually like, it's really good, but they are only giving us metrics around the watch time that we generate, and that's it. And it's good because it's around viewer satisfaction, but if you're somebody that's being more strategic around what it is that you're doing, and you're, you know, making a, a recommendation play, but you're also trying to rank your videos in search, you're trying to make sure that your thumbnails are working for you in the right places, then in that particular case, that's where you want to make sure that you're using TubeBuddy's A-B testing tool as well, um, alongside YouTube's a B testing tool also. So you can check that out as well as all of the other features that they have available within the tool at tubebuddy.com slash Nimmin. And of course, I've got a link in the video description and you can see it right up here on the screen as well. And the stream is co brought to you by StreamYard, which is the live streaming platform that I use to stream this every single Saturday, except last Saturday, because I was getting engaged at 9 a.m. Eastern. And the reason that I use StreamYard is because it's super easy. They do all the heavy lifting for me in the cloud. So like if, my, if some of my tech goes down or something like that, it's really awesome because it gives me the opportunity to, uh, you know, come in on my phone while I'm getting everything, you know, kind of restarted again. And uh, it basically just keeps everything moving and I don't lose the viewers that were hanging out in the stream. I don't have to set up a new stream and all that stuff. I can just come right back into it. But I can also add graphics graphics to the screen. I can add videos, you know, while I'm streaming. Um, you can also do video live streams with StreamYard as well to where you set it up that way. Um, you can add background graphics. You can bring on guests by just sending them a link, all kinds of really awesome, helpful stuff inside of StreamYard. But if you are a live streamer or somebody that's considering live streaming, StreamYard is the easiest live streaming platform that I've found. You can try it for yourself at StreamYard.com. And of course, I've got a link to that down in the description as well. All right. Okay. Good, 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 good. And uh, really quick, I'm just going to keep throwing promotional stuff at you. No, no I'm, not, I'm just kidding. But uh, but I just do want to remind you, for those of you that are TubeSpanner users, make sure you get your notepad out um, because we're going to be answering a lot of questions today. And I would just want to make sure that you don't miss anything and that you can come back and jump right to the timestamps of the places that, that were important to you. So uh, so make sure that you do that as well. As you can see, man, I missed, I missed a week. I'm a little bit rusty. A little bit rusty today, and D's not here, right? Uh, D is uh, preparing for his stream with Daniel here uh, a little bit on the StreamYard YouTube channel. So, uh, so it's going to be uh, all kinds of uh, fun as I uh, get kind of reacclimated here to uh, to the to 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 run in the uh, to run in the show. <laughs> I fun Chris, thanks for your support for eighteen months, man. Super appreciate it. So the very first question that we have um, to get us on track here and get this puppy moving is uh, from Case Keys. Case Keys does anime gaming challenges and rants. The goal of the channel is 100 subscribers. And the question is, what are some features that you would personally like to see be implemented into the YouTube Studio app on mobile? Um, I think that um, having, you know, because uh, I know that they're going to be rolling out, like, you know, help with titles and things like that. Having all that stuff, you know, right there in the, in the mobile app, I think would be really cool. Um, what else? 
really just full functions like uh you know on the youtube studio on a computer in advanced mode you can actually go in and you can really get granular when you're looking at your analytics and you can you know use like the grouping feature and stuff like that which is a really helpful tool to like really understand how people are responding to different you know content types to test calls to actions to test you know different things with what it is that you're doing so i wish that they that they had it as full featured so that you could go in there and it would be just as full featured as the uh you know as the desktop top version and you could go in there and you know do it that way i think that would be absolutely fantastic so uh dream builder 21 member for seven months thanks for your support over that seven months and just a reminder too for um everybody here that's a channel member um remember that we do have our uh community discord i was away a little bit while on vacation i would check in and just kind of read through stuff from time to time i've answered a few questions in there over the last week um but i do want to you know let you know that i'm back on track there and um you know that you do have access to that as part of your membership as well as the facebook group so uh, next up on our list here, we've got Doug Houston. What's up? Oh, check this out. So I was catching up as part of my things. I got to, you know, I'm getting back into my, you know, my, my routine here. And uh, one of the things that I did uh, or I was doing is I was catching up on Daryl E's stream uh, that he did last week. And, uh, and I saw in there that he hooked Doug Houston up with uh, Vid Summit tickets. And he's like, hey, you know, you can be my guest, you know, for Vid Summit. Super cool. Awesome of Daryl to do that. Um, but he couldn't have done it for a better person. Doug's awesome. He adds so much to the community. Thanks, Doug, for what it is that you do. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, share that as well. Super cool. Tube Spanner in the house. Thank you for the super chat. Says congratulations both uh, when you said that you were going to really boost your engagement. You were not messing around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's, that's the truth. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, the next question here is from, uh, exceptional indie games, exceptional indie games. They've, uh, they've, uh, been uploading one time per week or more. They've been on YouTube for less than a year. The type of channel is reviewing and showcasing indie games. The goal of the channel is to give great indie games more exposure. And the question is, I notice my videos do much better when they get impressions and views from browse. Do you have any tips on how to increase the chances a video gets picked up for, uh, for browse on YouTube? Many thanks to both of you for these live streams and all the content that you guys are definitely among the best YouTube experts. Thank you uh, for the kind words. Super appreciate it. So when it comes to uh, getting more attention from the browse features on YouTube, like if you're getting, if you're seeing it in the traffic source coming from browse, then in that particular case, you know, it's mostly coming from, you know, YouTube's home pages. Um, you can get some of that from the subscription feed also. But when it comes to browse features on YouTube, it's different. Like um, if you're targeting search, for example, it's relatively easy to get views from search because, you know, people are actively looking for the content that you've made and they are perfectly primed for that content as well. And they're focused, right? They're going in and they're typing it into the search bar. They're landing in the search results and they're, they're you know, perfectly primed for what it is that you've made. And then if your video shows up there, you are only competing with the other results that are there. And if you're in those top spots, YouTube starts messing it up, you know, past those top spots anyway. So if you can get in those top spots, it's, you know, good, it's a good, you know, real estate, so to speak. So because of that, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, search, it's really easy to get, to get views. But when it comes to browse features, it's a little bit different. And the fact that you're doing well in browse already is fantastic because when it comes to browse, it's, it's different because you have to get really good at being able to grab people's attention and pull them into your content when they weren't expecting to watch it. So, you know, for example, there's people that are logging onto YouTube right now and YouTube is showing them this live stream. And since they're showing them this live stream, I'm competing, if they're on a, if they're on a computer, I'm competing with a grid of videos, right? They're logging on just to watch something or, you know, whatever, um, or to learn something. And then they see my live stream there. So I have to try to grab their attention. Um, if somebody is on a mobile device and they're sitting there scrolling, then in that particular case, again, if they're not expecting to watch this stream and this, you know, stream pulls up there, I have to be able to grab their attention. So in order to do that, in my particular case, I put like YouTube logos, I'll use the word creator a lot, I'll use the word YouTuber a lot, things like that. And those are just little things that help people be able to identify that this content is about something that they care about. So when it comes to browse features, let's see if I can... Uh, uh, let's see if I can find a good example here. I'll use the mouse again. This is this is my go-to. But when it comes to uh, browse features on YouTube, uh, the the way that you package your videos is different. The 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 topics of your videos are different. So, for example, if you're making a video that is targeted for YouTube search, in that particular case, it could be a list video. You know, the best you know places to go in Japan. Um, it could be. 
um, a video about, you know, uh, Logitech, you know, M3 master mouse review, um, you know, how to use Opus Clip, right? That kind of thing. And those types of videos are fantastic for search and they can also get recommended as well. You can get browse traffic from them. But the difference is when you start at the video idea when it comes to getting attention from browse features is you make sure that you're doing the right things in order to grab their attention and make the content relevant to somebody and to larger groups of people, which is a really important part of it. So when it comes to search, if I was doing, we're going to use this mouse, this is my kind of go-to for this. When it comes to search, if I was, um, you know, trying to get search traffic for this mouse, one of the things that I could do is I could make a review of this mouse. I could compare this, ma this mouse against other mouses, mice um, for computers. Um, so, you know, this mouse versus, you know, another mouse, things like that. When people are looking for it, then I might show up there. When it comes to home pages, it's different because now you have to get people interested in this mouse that might not know what it is. They might not really, you know, care that much. So because of that, the packaging and everything it is that you do with that video would be different. So if it was a review, then in that case, you'd, you'd make it crystal clear. This is a review of blah, blah, blah. And, you know, during this, we're going to be sharing these things, these things, the tech, all that. Um, but when it comes to the video idea for when you're targeting uh, the recommendation features, we're just going to go broad with it there. But when you're targeting the recommendation features of YouTube, it's different. So instead of it just being a review for this Logitech mouse and the title being, you know, Logitech M3 uh, uh, MX Master, sorry, MX Master 3 mouse review, instead of your title being something like that, in your thumbnail being, you know, let's say just like a picture, you know, of the mouse, then your thumbnail could still just be a picture of the mouse, but your title might be something like this mouse changed the way that I work or this mouse increased my productivity by X percent um, or, you know, something like that. So that when people are hitting the home page, they might not necessarily be thinking about, oh, hey, I need to upgrade my mouse. But when they see a thumbnail and then they read the title and they're like, oh, this increases person's productivity by 83 percent. Well, then let's see what it is. I mean, it's just a mouse. How could it possibly help? And then in that particular case, you just open it up up to you know a lot more people so the same exact thing goes i'll give another example here really quick so let's say that you are making gaming content because i know we got a lot, of, a lot of gamers in here because we always do so if you are making gaming content the same exact thing applies so let's say that you have a video that you're going hey thanks jerry uh uh uh, but let's say that you are going after search, same exact thing. It starts at the topic. So maybe you would make videos about how to solve, you know, different levels or how to beat different bosses or, you know, map walkthroughs, you know, just you'd solve people's problems essentially in YouTube search. Um, and then when it came to the homepage, in that particular case, it might be, you know, this hidden, you know, Fortnite um, you know, area is where you find all the loot or something like that. And then with that, you use the fort, the Fortnite, uh, you know, imagery. And uh, that imagery is going to help people identify that it has something to do with Fortnite. And then the top or then the title itself is something that is a little bit, I'm not going to say sensational, but it's just a little bit more like, oh, this is something that I need to see or something that I, you know, like, like, oh, I got to click on this is kind of the idea, right? So when you are, packaging your content in terms of your topic, your title and your thumbnail for the recommendation features of YouTube, you have to make sure that you're thinking about it through that lens of if somebody lands on YouTube, in that particular case, like how am I going to help them identify this as something that they care about, and then compel them to click on it, right, make it more interesting than just base information. Okay. Um, in addition to that, when you are going after the recommendation features on YouTube, it's also helpful to also think about, okay, this is likely to be shown to people within my niche uh, or just, you know, just people. We'll just do it that way. Um, the people that YouTube thinks, not just people within your niche, but the people that YouTube thinks are likely to enjoy that content. This is likely to be shown uh, to those people. So because of that, let me make sure that within my niche, I am trying to make those topics where I'm targeting browse features as uh, relevant to as many people within uh, my niche or the people that are interested in my type of content, uh, make it as relevant to as many of those people as possible. And when you start taking that approach, then that is going to help you, you know, get more attention from browse features, because it basically just comes down to your topics, your packaging, um, and making sure that the content just can take all that into a nutshell, right? <laughs> comes down to your topic, um, comes down to your packaging, and then it comes down to um, trying to make it 
um, as relevant to a broader amount of people as possible because YouTube is just going to be trying it against people, right? Hey, look, wonder if this, wonder, if, wonder if these people are going to like it. Wonder if these people are going to like it. And the better you get at being like, okay, out of all, out of all the things that I talk about on my YouTube channel, um, what are the things that are the uh, most relevant to the largest group of people that I'm, you know, trying to reach with my content? Really long answer. So, <laughs> so let's see here. So next up on the list here. Okay, so we did that, did that. Did do. Oh, and one more thing um, that I do want to mention as well, and then we'll move on to the next question. But you say here that you notice your videos do much better when they get impressions and views from browse. So another thing too is, you know, is when you do get that better response from the recommendation features in general, if you get a better response on home pages, then YouTube's going to keep showing your content to people there. If you get a good response on, you know, suggested videos, YouTube's going to keep showing your content there. If you get a really good response in YouTube search and you're competitive against the other videos there, then YouTube's going to keep showing your content there. So, um, and they're going to keep giving you more impressions, uh, in other words. So because of that, you know, with you tapping into the recommendation features and being able to pull people in and getting the most activity there, um, you're, you're definitely on the right path. Let's see here. So next up, we've got uh, Home Rapid Repair in the house. What's going on, man? Hope you are doing fantastic. Uh, they upload one time per week or more, been on YouTube for a year or more. Rob the Maritimer, thank you for the kind words. Glad that you are enjoying the content. Super appreciate it. Uh, they do home rapid repair videos. The goal of the channel is to share my experience and be a resource for DIYers. The question is, hey, Nick, I have a friend and a channel grew slowly to 100,000 subs. Now it's exploding with growth. Is it possible to predict when growth could become exponential? He has hundreds of videos in his back catalog. Yeah, so uh, one thing that can happen, and, and this happens to a lot of people, and this is why it's so important. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this before, but I mention this from time to time. Uh, when you are making content, it's important to make sure that all the videos that you publish to your channel are as good as as good as they can be. Even if you're not getting the results that you're that you're hoping for yet, once you have one video just land with a certain group of people, YouTube's going to start testing your back catalog with them. And when they are testing your back catalog with those viewers and those viewers start responding to it, then they're going to keep giving them more videos from those back catalogs. So if you just keep trying to make good videos and you keep trying to, you know, serve your audience and then all the videos that you're publishing to your channel are relevant to a certain group of people, then in that particular case, it creates the opportunity for you to really start getting some traction fast, right? But in that particular case, with your friend that's like blowing up, in terms of, you know, predicting exponential growth, not really, because you can you can take really calculated guesses in terms of, okay, historically on our channel, when we do these things, people will respond better. When we publish videos about these things, people respond better. Um, when we do this in our intros, people typically watch for longer periods of time. When we add pattern interrupts around these parts of the video, people usually watch, you know, past those parts, or they re-engage and watch, you know, longer. Um, when we link to, you know, uh, you know, uh, when we have more people clicking on our end screens, uh, you know, in getting toward the, that far in our video, then, you know, the videos will typically do better, that kind of stuff. Like when you start noticing those things, then you can start being like, okay, you know, this is going to do well, or we can predict that it's likely to do well. But at the end of the day, you know, sometimes we think a video is going to do great, and then we flub it, <laughs> right? And then other times, you know, we uh, think a video is going to suck, and then we publish it, and it ends up doing fantastic. So, you know, because of that, you can get an idea for like, okay, if I publish this within the next, you know, week or the next 90 days, depending on, you know, your content type and how people are responding to what you're doing, um, within the next week or the next month or the next 90 days, whatever, there's a really good chance that this video is probably going to get at least X amount of views on it. So there will be a point where you can do that sort of thing. Um, but when it comes to being able to just nail it, like, hey, as long as we do this by, you know, Tuesday, three months from now, this channel is going to be blowing up. Um, that's that's a really, really, uh, you know, yeah, I, I would say, you know, a hard no <laughs> on that one. Uh, Creator Classroom says, three years ago, I was on the verge of giving up on YouTube. I came across your uh, Saturday live stream and you changed my viewpoint. Thanks so much, Nick. Thank you for the kind words. Glad that you, uh, glad that uh, you're impacted in that way. That's awesome. Thank you for 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 saying that. Tom Nash, what's going on, dude? Hope you're doing great. And says, love the hoodie. Yeah, they gave this to me at, uh, it was at, uh, I think it might have been Vid Summit, um, actually, that I got this. You, you might even, oh, no, you haven't been there yet, I don't think. Yeah, dude, you should go. But, uh, uh, yeah, they, uh, they gave this, uh, they're passing these out. It wasn't just for me. They're passing these out at uh, Vid Summit. 
I love it too. It's like lightweight. I wish, but you know, it's not me that's making it, but I, I wish that the zipper was dark because I don't, I don't like the white zipper running down the middle. I wish it was dark. Scrap and pallet, man. What's going on? Hope that you are doing fantastic. Crushing, of course, as usual. Tom Nash says, Nick, I was here for the 12,000 subs live, dude. Do you remember? Man, I, I, I don't. I remember, I remember in one stream when I was crossing like 30, I remember being live uh, during that particular stream, but I don't, uh, I don't remember the 12,000 because I know I started on doing like the mobile streams um, right a little bit after 10,000. I might have had 12,000 actually. It might have been, it might have been one of my first streams uh, that you were in in that case. Super track. Ching King says, um, I can't stick around, but wanted to congratulate you. I also wanted to let you know um, how much I genuinely appreciate the help that you offer creators. Cha-ching, thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you for the super chat. Glad that you're enjoying the content and um, uh, glad that you're getting value from the, uh, the time that we uh, spend here together on YouTube. So uh, next up on the list here, we've got Her Heel Review. Uploads one time per week or more. They do movie and TV reviews. The goal of the channel is to make awesome movie-related content. The goal of the channel is uh, to make awesome movie-related content. And the question is, are there any people doing vertical lives really well that you'd recommend? No one in my space is really doing them on YouTube. Um, I'd give it a shot. Maybe if it's something that you're interested in and you think that your audience, because, you know, you're doing, I think, you know, if you're doing movie-related content, really good chance you can just talk about things that are popular right now. Um, if I was doing movie-related content, that's what I would do, is I would I would do, you know, vertical live streams and shorts as well as long-form content, but I would do those because there's a lot of people that are interested in movies. So I would talk about new movies that are coming out, talk about, you know, like, Hey, you know, these are the people that are going to be in it. Um, these are my opinions on it, you know, that type of thing. Um, and start, you know, building up your audience around the opinions that you have around the movies that are coming out, your expectation of them, you know, things like that. Um, I, yeah, I would, I would definitely try it and then, you know, just track it and see, uh, see how it does. Next up on the list, and really quick, if you are just joining us, um, I do want to let you know there's a form down in the description below if you're on YouTube where you can get your, uh, where you can put your question in and we'll get an answer on the stream here today. Um, also, if you are watching on a platform that does not have clickable links, um, you know, anywhere like on X, for example, you can just go to nicknimmon.com slash ask and you can put your question into the form there. So next up, we got World of KRS. Uh, they upload when they have time, been on YouTube for less than a month. They do art rants, challenges, and animation. The goal of the channel is to build up my art as a type of portfolio to get hired, but also to create my own anime. Question, not, uh, so in the future, I want to add music for the channel. So in your opinion, can it be a good thing is I create both art and music on the same channel? Um, I personally would separate those. The reason that I would separate those is because they're, you're, you're gonna have different people interested in the different content. So, I mean, technically you could put them on the same channel, but I wouldn't. So what I would do is I would make a channel, one channel that would be a resource for art lovers. And then I would make another channel that would be a resource for music lovers. The reason that's important is because when you publish a video, YouTube is showing it to the people that are the most engaged in your channel first. So because of that, um, it's really helpful to make sure that everything that you publish is in alignment with the people that are interacting with your, that your content and enjoying it. So when you start diluting the content like that, then what happens is, let's say that I subscribe to your YouTube channel. I'm like, wow, this art is just, this is, this stuff's the best I've ever seen. To huge fan, absolutely love your art. And then you publish a music video. I'm probably not even going to recognize that it's yours, right? And if I don't listen to music videos on YouTube, which I do, by the way, but, but if, you know, I'm a type of viewer that doesn't, in that particular case, I'm not going to click on it because it's not relevant to me, but because I'm super engaged in your channel, I watched 10 of your videos, commented on every one of them, liked them all, subscribed to your channel. I'm sharing your videos with friends. YouTube is detecting all that. And YouTube's like, yep, we're showing everything to this person, <laughs> right? Then what's going to happen? They're going to show me the, your music content. And then YouTube's going to be like, wow, the most engaged people are not responding to this. Um, it may not impact you long term, but it can. So because of that, I, I would totally separate those and I would have art on one and music on the other, unless you can come up with a clever way to, you know, combine everything. Like one of the things that I do here is, you know, cause I, you know, dabble in music. I'm not that good at it, but I dabble in music. And, uh, because of that, I'm like, 
like, hey, you know, I have this platform, so let me just kind of share it from time to time. So because of that, I just do fun stuff. I have like a, you know, subscriber, you know, call to action, you know, anthem type song that I made. And I play that. It's just, it's just all like 20 seconds. Um, I have a coffee song that I play before my live streams right now. Um, there's a segment of these streams that I want to do where we pull up channels and we start reviewing channels, just giving like one quick tip or spending like a 30 minute or 30 seconds on a YouTube channel, just giving some quick tips. So because of that, I'm like, okay, let's make a little, you know, track for it. And I'm building out the, uh, you know, the the song on my guitar and, uh, you know, basically going to make it a little bit different than from the other stuff that I've done. And, and these uh, little corny things that I do, you know, here on the YouTube channel with the music is a way for me to just kind of, you know, express myself that way and just kind of share like, you know, Hey, I can do this too. It's not just, you know, YouTube. So, uh, uh, because of that, um, you know, you can try to find, you know, fun ways to, you know, express what it is that you're doing through your art channel. But, um, but if you're going to be publishing music, then I would definitely make a music channel, um, for that. Oh, hey. If you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. Next up on our list here, we got Stunt7, Stup7 uploads when they have time. They've been on YouTube for less than six months. They have a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is to have fun mostly and maybe earn some money. The question is, is it always worth it to enable YouTube membership? So like, if I don't know if anyone would buy it, should I still make it? It's extra money right? It's extra, it's extra money. And if you can offer something in return for that extra money, then in that particular case, you know, you are, it's an exchange of value, right? So what you're doing there is you're like, okay, if you join the membership, some people will just do it as like a support tier, like, hey, I'm not giving you anything, but you are just doing this as to support the, you know, channel so I can keep making more content, you know, that whole thing. Um, others will have a bunch of different tiers where it's like, okay, if you join for this, you get, you know, these things. If you join for this, you get these things. If you join for this, you get, you know, all of those things plus these things. And they create like a, you know, like a full blown you know, ecosystem, so to speak, around their around their channel memberships. Um, one thing that I do recommend is that if you don't have plans of doing it on any other platform, then in that particular case, absolutely do it on YouTube. Um, however, when you do do that on YouTube, just keep in mind that your ad revenue is going to be tied to YouTube and your channel memberships are going to be tied to YouTube and any of the affiliate stuff that you end up doing through YouTube shopping and all that. If you end up doing that, all that's going to be tied to YouTube. And if you end up in a situation where you make a mistake that you like you break a rule that you didn't know existed and because of that, your monetization gets taken away, then you lose it all. So because of that, if you are somebody that's watching this and you're like, okay, I want to have memberships um, and YouTube is definitely the easiest because you don't have to have any technical know-how to set it all up. It's all just kind of built in. You've got to fill in some boxes. But if you are somebody that's wanting memberships, just consider like, yeah, okay, I can have them on, I can have them on YouTube and I can add value there. Um, but if you want to get serious about it and you want to protect yourself, because I always talk about sustainability because I've been doing this for almost a decade. So I always talk about sustainability and I like to remind people that it's also helpful to, you know, have something going off platform so that in the event that something like that does happen, you break a rule that you didn't know existed or, you know, the channel gets, you know, compromised in some way, something like that. Then in that particular case, you know, you don't lose everything overnight. You have some burn time, so to speak, or you just have, you know, you basically just stop that channel and then you, you know, start a new one or you start on TikTok or whatever to drive traffic to the thing that you, you know, the thing that you have. So just make sure that you are kind of shielding yourself uh, in that way if you are somebody that's going all in on this. I actually, uh, you know, while I was traveling, I, uh, I hopped on Reddit one morning and there was a content creator on the partnered YouTube subreddit. If you're a partner content creator and you are on Reddit, I recommend that you join that particular subreddit. A lot of cool information is shared there. Uh, if you're a new YouTuber, I would join it too. Um, they kind of come, they kind of come down on new YouTubers, uh, new YouTubers a little bit, you know, they'll be like, why are you asking that here? This is partnered if it's for something really basic, but I recommend people join it if they're new, because then you at least the feedback and information that you do get when you have questions is from people with experience instead of people that don't know, you know, that, that know, you know, less than you do possibly about, you know, what it is that you're doing. So, uh, but anyway, I was on that subreddit and someone made, yeah, I'm actually going to read this to you actually first, before I do this, cause I don't want to, you know, uh, waste time on this if nobody's considering this, but is there anybody here that is considering, 
going full time, just going all in on your YouTube channel. And you're like, you know what? Yeah, this is definitely something that I'm going to do. I'm going to do it relatively soon. Um, considering like quitting my job, maybe like, is there anybody here that is in that particular situation? If not, then I'm not going to, I won't bring that up. Um, but if, if, if you are that person, then, um, I just want to, I'm going to share this with you really quick. Creator classroom says all in Rob Mayer timer says, yes, we got some people trying. Okay. So, so let, I'm going to share this with you really quick. I'm going to pull it up and I'm, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, because it's important that everybody, uh, that everybody just kind of thinks about this stuff, because if you're not a full-time creator, sometimes, um, it's really easy, especially if you work a job that you just do not like or something like that. It's really easy to, to be like, you know what? Um, uh, you know, I need to get out of this job as fast as I can. So I'm just going all in on YouTube. Don't get me wrong. I'm an extreme, like I'm, when it comes to like taking risks and stuff, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, like I'm pretty, I think risk averse is the, uh, is the, is the words I'm looking for. But for me, um, I, you know, I had my, uh, design service stuff that I was doing. Um, and then I was also doing YouTube, but then, you know, I got it to the point to where I was like, it was really close. And I was like, you know what? All in. Right. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just going to I'm just going to read this for you. So the question was, um, they said risking your job for YouTube. They say over the past several months, I've spent every day wanting to quit my job. I've been at this job for over a decade now, and I'm just so emotionally tired. And I just want to go absolutely deep into trying to make YouTube slash streaming work. I'm a very small creator. And this in this case, it's a little bit different than some. But they say I'm a, I'm a really small creator of around 3,000 subs. So I know that I would be risking everything, but I have enough money to last me three to four months. I'm lost, confused, and no idea what to do. Um, I just know that I love making content. So my response to this was, and this got uh, like tons of upvotes, um, just because you know, because it, it made sense. That's this is why I'm sharing it because it resonated, you know, with others. So I want to share it to you know with you if you're considering going all in. But it says, but I said, uh, don't do it yet. I say, in order to make YouTube your work, you need to be able to monetize. Don't worry about subs because they mentioned how many subscribers I had. I said, don't worry about subs. Focus on how you can make money because that's what you're going to need when you quit your job. I say to do this, make sure that you're in a niche that's easy to monetize because your lifestyle depends on it. If you only rely on ad revenue, you'll be a slave to YouTube and are likely to burn out. If you monetize in other ways through affiliate marketing or making your own products or offering services or something like that, then you won't be as dependent on ads. Then if your channel gets demonetized for breaking a rule that you didn't know about, which happens all the time, um, you don't get, you don't go back to zero overnight, which is kind of, that, that's kind of what sparked, you know, me making this reference. Another thing I said, is I said, I've been doing this for a decade in September, um, and I've seen a lot of people make that leap too fast. Here's what you want to do. So here's the steps. One, I'm going to make a video about this too, by the way. And I'm probably going to do some uh, like, uh, you know, like I actually want to, you know, act, do some like training or something on this too. But number one is figure out how to monetize in the best ways. If you need a second channel for monetization so you can have a passion channel, that's fine. If the goal is to make money from YouTube, do that so that you can take the leap if it's required for right now. Um, two, look into self-employment tax, social security, and all the other wonderful things, sarcastic, you know, notation there, things that uh, come from being self-employed and factor them into the money that you're going to need to generate. You'll also need to figure out if you're going to set up a company for your channel, um, how you're going to pay yourself and so on. You're starting a business, so you need to handle the business things as much as you need to do the creative things. Number three, set the amount that you need to replace your income and cover the additional expenses of being self-employed. In addition to extra taxes, you can write things off too, so that part isn't, you know, all bad. Uh, you'll also need to consider health insurance and retirement accounts. For example, if your company gives you a 401k match, you're going to lose it, which means that you're also going to need to replace that loss and accept or accept the hit. But either way, it's important to consider retirement. Factor all of these things into the money that you're going to need every month before you make that leap. Four, start trying to actually make money. <laughs> so, right, instead of just being dependent, oh, it's live, uh, AB Cami. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, you know, just being like, hey, you know, I hope I, you know, get some ad revenue, or I hope that some of these other things I'm going to try work, like start actually trying to make money. Um, everything adds up. So do it. But when you're attempting to make money, you'll find the, the things that generate more and the things that generate less. This will help you know what to do more of when trying to make more money. You'll also start to paint a realistic picture of what you're up against. You can make staggering amounts of money from YouTube, but it's not easy. Some niches are harder than others, and for some, it's nearly impossible outside of ad revenue. So this step is going to let you know where your niche stands, right? And I actually have a video on my channel 
about how to uh, how to make a YouTube channel for the purpose of generating revenue. And within that, I talk about how to like research other channels. I have like a, a Google Doc that you can uh, access uh, and you can copy it as like a spreadsheet so you can actually like, you know, do some research on some channels and stuff. But anyway, I say once you start generating money, um, you'll want to leave your job even more. Wait. Make sure that you can do it consistently and make sure that the amounts that you generate are enough for your lifestyle. Six, live as frugally as possible during this period and put your YouTube money and your work money into an interest bearing saving account um, until you have six months to one year, depending on your risk tolerance um, of money saved up to support your lifestyle. This is so important. And I'm going to I'm going to really put some emphasis on this one, too. This is so important because it will allow you to embrace the creative mode once you make the jump instead of going into panic mode. Anxiety and fear pollutes our creative processes as humans and the panic can cause you to make bad decisions. Now, quick disclaimer, some people, they thrive in those situations, right? Some people are like, hey, my back's against the wall, um, so like whatever it takes, right? Other people are like, okay, uh, you know, um, I'm freaking out, I don't know what to do. If I don't, you know, if this video doesn't just go through the, moon, go through the roof, then I'm, I'm, I'm done, and because of that, you know, they, they have that extra pressure and they, and they can't handle it. Number seven, once all of the above are in place, you have a clear runway to quit your job and you're able to create in a way that's fulfilling instead of because you have to. Again, that's super important because it will allow you to make decisions that add value to you and your viewers instead of, if this video doesn't do well, I'm gonna have to go back to work. Um, and then I, a couple more notes I made really quick, we're almost done here, then we'll get back into the questions. But it says, another thing to note is that uh, creative for fun, creating for fun and creating for income are two completely different things. You can absolutely combine the two, but once your livelihood depends on your content, it becomes a completely different thing. Going through the steps that I listed, um, it's going to suck because it's going to take some time, but the rewards waiting for you on the other end might change your life in ways that you cannot imagine right now as a hobby creator. I also want to let you know that going full-time is a reality and that there are more and more creators doing it every day, so it is possible, and don't let anyone discourage you from your vision. Most of the creators I have as friends are, waking, are making well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars per year, and some are making millions, and that's true and a fact, um, but it's hard, and it takes a a lot of dedication, strategic thinking, consistency, networking, good niche, and patience. Also, if you go all, go all in, get YouTube figured out, and then if you want to amplify the money that you're making, start posting everywhere else too. This is also, also a safety mechanism in the event that your channel gets hacked or YouTube or the FTC makes a rule that makes it more difficult to make money on YouTube in the future. And then good luck. Right. So when it comes to uh, that, that's the end of the, the thing right there. But just something to you know, consider if you are somebody that is, you know, wanting to just like, you know, be like, OK, this job sucks. I want to just be a creator full time. I encourage you to like follow, you know, follow that if that's something that you want to do. Um, but just make sure that you're preparing for it in a way that that you know that you can do it comfortably and that you can make sure that you're making the right decisions and being able to financially take care of yourself, you know, through the process. Uh, as well. All right, let's get back into the uh, questions. Uh, let's get back into the uh, questions. Hey, Tom, thanks, man. Appreciate that. I do, actually. 10 months of great advice. Thank you. Says Amazing Yacht Destinations member for 10 months. Thank you so much for your support over the last 10 months. I appreciate it. So, uh, let's see here. so next up on the list here, the next question that we have is uh, from Stunt7. Stunt7 uploads when they have time. Uh, they've been on YouTube for less than six months. It's a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is to have fun mostly and maybe earn some money. The question is, is it always worth it to enable... Oh, we did this one already. That's what, that's what got that whole thing started, right? <laughs> so uh, let's see here. Next up, we've got uh, Shad Vlog. Shad Vlog says they have a vlog channel. The goal of the channel is for financial freedom and because I love to do it. Question, I started uploading vlogs on a YouTube account that had restrictions on it, but I didn't upload on it for a while. Should I have started a separate channel? Um, if you had an account, it was an old account, and you had some violations on it already, if it was me, I would have started it on a new channel. The reason for that is just because you get to start with a clean slate, right? Start with a clean slate, you're making different content now. So because of that, you know, all the content on that channel would be, you know, for those people that are interested in that type of content instead of mixing, you know, some of the old videos that you had. Uh, if it was me and I was starting from scratch, um, I would definitely start with like a brand new, fresh Google account. 
that includes, uh, you know, Gmail and, you know, docs, all that stuff. Um, but a fresh Google account and a fresh YouTube channel. So uh, let's see here. So next up we've got, oh no, I think my mouse just died. Uh oh. RIP mouse. Okay. So uh, next up we've got, okay, we did shad vlogs. You know, we're just going to turn the mouse off. Hmm. What do you think of that mouse? We're going touch screen. So we've got trying to learn bikes, trying to learn bikes, uploads one time per week or more. They've been on YouTube for a year or more. They do motorcycle maintenance. The goal of the channel is to upload videos for the challenge in competing on the world stage. The question is, I recently received a notification from YouTube that stated new copyright matches found review videos that may be using your content. My question is, as a very small channel, why would I care if someone else is using my content? Isn't it a good thing that my video is getting more exposure or is it a bad idea not to try immediate, not to try to immediately shut it down, stop the use of my content. Um, this is personal preference. So me, when people use mine without permission, um, if they just download it and re-upload it somewhere, um, in the past I've, you know, I, I've taken those down. I, I usually issue the seven day. So they give you the option to take it down now and then to another option to give them a seven day notice to where it sends them a notification. And then once they get that notification, it gives them seven days to take the content down. Uh, that's usually the route that I go. But some some content creators don't care. Like for example, um, during, I think it was during a tube spanner stream, we were doing channel reviews and during that stream uh i noticed there's there's this uh youtube channel uh it's called mono man m-o-n-o-m-a-n and on that channel they have a instrumental it's a acoustic guitar instrumental uh, and it's called meditations it's like an hour long and it's a three minute song but they loop it for an hour and it's just great background music. Like it's just com just completely chilled out. If you're if you're like having a bad day, or you're thinking a lot, or you're just like, hey, you know what? I just want to like completely chill out while I work or something, or just while I'm hanging out, you know, at home, anything. Perfect for that. But anyway, that particular video it has almost a hundred million views on that particular song. And while I was doing the channel reviews over on the Tube Spanner channel, I noticed somebody else had that thumbnail and I was like what so I clicked into it and they you know they had that song in there and they had in the video description credit at mono man which highlighted you know a direct link to mono man's YouTube channel so I'm certain that they know about it but they just let them keep it up so you know when it comes to that sort of thing it really is just a, a, a personal preference like one of the reasons that I take them down is when people do that on mine it's usually affiliate videos so in my opinion, if they are going to be selling something as an affiliate, they need to make the content for it. Um, because if they're selling the same thing I am, then they're technically competing with me with my own content for the same things that I'm, you know, bringing attention to. So because of that, you know, I take it down. But if it, if it was, you know, something, uh, if I was doing entertainment content or something like that, maybe I would let them keep it up. But I don't know. Like, I'm weird about that just because you know, you guys know how, you know, you, you guys know how it is, you know, you put a lot of time and effort and energy and thought and all that stuff into your content. And, you know, when somebody takes it, it's like, Hey, like what, what's going on here? What are you doing? You know what I mean? So, uh, so because of that, you know, um, uh, there's that. Hopefully that helped. Next up on our list here, you know what? I'm actually going to do something here really quick. Let me just kind of roll that over there kind of move that there we go okay turn that back off since it's on its way out so next up we've got us plus dad hey what's going on hope you're doing great hope you guys are going to vid summit again this year hope to see you there uh they do daily content uh the type of channel is roblox role play goal of the channel is to create the most interactive roblox community the question is as a once mainly shorts channel the vertical live streaming has been a huge game changer thank you roberta blake for suggesting it um, just got our 4,000 watch hours for video monetization. Could you go over uh, recommended monetization settings, especially for live stream? Thanks for all you do. Yeah, so when it comes to Brian G. Johnson in the house, what's going on, dude? Hope you're doing awesome. Nice to see you in here. As always, nice to see you. So when it comes to your monetization settings, um, it really comes down to, uh, you know, making sure that you just have everything turned on that you want turned on. So some people choose to do mid-roll ads. Other people do not. Uh, if your content is over eight minutes, then in that particular case, you get the option to add more ads into your video while the viewer is watching. Not everyone is going to see that. So if you add those, don't think 
that when you publish your video that every single person that goes through it is going to you know keep getting interrupted in your video if you have ads in it um youtube has like an ad tolerance so if somebody goes into your video let's say they see uh, a pre-roll on the way in they see a, a, an ad before your video starts in that particular case what's going to happen is you know they're going to get into the video and depending on how long the video is they might not see one of those mid-roll ads if they you know if that ad tolerance for that user is uh longer than the you know that ad placement that you have so because of that not everybody's going to see that and you can even see this on pre-rolls and everything so now that you're monetized you can go in and you can see your monetized views so you have your views and then you have your monetized views as well so when you go in there and you look at that, then it's like, oh, okay, well, not every view is monetized. It's the same exact way for those mid-rolls. In addition to that, you also have a lot of premium users also. So premium users aren't gonna see that either. But when it comes to those settings, a couple things that I recommend is because you do, uh, you know, Roblox, Roblox role play stuff. So if there is certain parts of your story that you need to, you know, follow through in order to get to the next part of the story, in order to you know make it like oh, okay we're building this part up you know whatever then in that particular case i wouldn't put a mid-roll during that build up uh because you know you want to let that release happen first before you do something like that um so i would definitely not do that or if i wouldn't put them anywhere where it's going to interrupt the actual story that somebody needs to follow right because you, you know the whole thing is you're pulling them in right you're grabbing their attention you're pulling them in you're keeping them engaged and the last thing you want to do is is break that so uh because of that just keep that in mind um in addition to that if you are promoting something if, if in your particular case um i'm not sure if you are but for anybody else you know i i want to mention this as well if you are a content creator that's promoting something Let's say that you're doing a review and uh, during that review, let's say you're reviewing Roger Wakefield's coffee cup. Okay. Then in that particular case, before you tell people where they can get that coffee cup in your video description, or before you get through all of the highlights of that coffee cup or anything that would distract the person that might build that or might make that purchase, um, do not sacrifice that higher commission on those purchases for the little tiny eensy weensy teensy weensy little bit of ad revenue that you get per ad view. Um, uh, you want to make sure that you are making it possible for people to get to, you know, to the thing that you're that you're actually trying to bring attention to in the video. Silver Seeker, thank you for the kind words. Hope you're doing awesome. Uh, let's see here. So next up on the list, and hey, really quick, also um, for those of you, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Brian G. Johnson, who just popped into the chat. If you're not, though, just in case, um, he's been putting out tons of content lately. Like Brian is just absolutely on fire. Um, click on his channel name. Go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. He also uh, teaches people about YouTube, and uh, he does a lot of you know like search based stuff. He gets into like storytelling and you know uh, just in general engagement like that kind of stuff. Really excellent content. You'll learn a ton you know from Brian over there. Um, he's also it's just a really good teacher. He's re like really smart about YouTube, um, and he's a really good teacher. So because of that, um, if you you know are not familiar with him definitely head over to his YouTube channel, click on his channel name. His name is Brian G. Johnson here in the chat. Click on his channel name. Doug just dropped the link. Oh, no, he didn't. Um, but click on his channel name, head over there and uh, and subscribe to his YouTube channel and watch his videos. Um, really good teacher, really good at what it, what it is that he does and he'll help you a ton. And he's got, you know, a poodle to feed too. And it's hungry. <laughs> two, two. So uh, Tube Shala says they upload when they have time. Um, they have a tutorial channel. The goal of the channel is to give more and more value to the audience. The question is facing challenges and getting views and subscribers. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Who else here is facing challenges in getting views and subscribers on your YouTube channel? Just say me, if you are. Because I want to talk about this for a second. If you're somebody that is uh fa you know ch facing the challenge of getting views just in general or subscribers to your youtube channel a few different things i want to i want to talk about the very first is that when it comes okay we got some me's rolling in here now okay so the very first thing to think about is that it's really easy for us i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna talk about just some mindset stuff first and then we're gonna get you know a little bit more tactical so the very first thing is that it's really easy as a new content creator even an experienced content creator 
to compare yourself to people that have more time to do the thing or that compare to compare yourself to people that have teams of people helping them do it or to compare yourself to people that um, you just have a lot of experience or they know how to do the thing or, you know, they've learned over a long period of time, you know, how to make really good content. It's really easy to be like, oh, my gosh, why are they getting, you know, thousands of views or tens of thousands of views or hundreds of thousands of views or millions of views? And I'm getting like, you know, 100 views or 500 views or 1000 views, you know, depending on where you're at. Um, it's really easy to, you know, to make those comparisons. But keep in mind that, you know, this whole entire thing, and I always mention this at the, at the end of the stream too, but this whole entire thing is a, it, it's a learning curve. So the more you work on it and the more that you learn different aspects of YouTube and different aspects of making content and different aspects about your audience, and you really tune in to like, okay, who is it that I'm really making content for? And what is it that I'm really trying to do? Things like that. Um, those are the things that, that will help you ultimately do better on YouTube. So the important thing is to just kind of embrace where you're at in the learning curve and be like, okay, um, I'm new at this or I only spend a certain amount of time on this per week. So because of that, um, let me just kind of embrace that. And then from there, I'm just going to do as good as I can. And instead of being like, okay, I'm going to look for like, you know, hey, should I be spending money on ads to get views or, you know, should I be joining these like, you know, groups on, you know, getting subscribers for uh, for my videos and, you know, things like that. Instead of working on any of that stuff, just work on your skill sets, right? Like learn how to make thumbnails through watching videos and like reading information about graphic design, color theory, um, framing that kind of stuff. Um, learn how to, you know, process your photos. If your content, if it's important for your content type, learn how to take photos. If it's important to your content type, um, learn how to actually make videos, right? One of the things that you hear me say a lot is that there's a big difference between cutting a video and editing a video. Cutting a video, you're just going in, cutting out some silence, maybe you're adding some B-roll or whatever. Editing your videos, you're being really intentional about the experience that the viewer is having and the way that they're, you know, getting information through the story that you're telling or through the things that you're teaching or, you know, the things that you're showing people how to do, depending on the type of content that you're making. Um, so because of that, um, just make sure that you are, you know, focused on, you know, building the skills. So on your thumbnails, like I mentioned, um, on the video content, make sure you are doing, working on that actively learning how to edit. Um, Hayden Hellier Smith is like the channel to watch. Like if you are wanting to get better at video editing and telling stories in your content and all of that, go watch his videos, Hayden Hellier Smith. Um, and in addition to that, you also need to be working on your presentation. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're on camera or not. Like if you're using your voice, your voice also, you know, communicates in a certain way where you put inflections matters. Um, the, your tone and how you, you know, communicate in general, all those things matters, uh, matter. When you pause or you choose not to pause, all of those things matter and they impact, you know, your presentation. If you use fill words like I am with my, you know, and like, and you know, stuff like that, you know, those types of things, you know, they also impact it. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're practicing those types of things so that you can improve the skill sets around what it is that you're doing. Um, in addition to that, um, it's really important to also just learn about YouTube in general. So in addition to my channel, there's a ton of different, you know, YouTube help channels, but you want to make sure that you're being very careful about the ones that are just over the top spammy. Cause there's, there's definitely been a little bit of sleaze that's kind of creeped in a little bit. There's some amazing channels, even some amazing new ones as well, but there's been like a little bit of sleaze. It's kind of, you know, a little bit of slimy edge, you know, kind of, so to speak on, you know, on the, on the help space. So because of that, just make sure that you are verifying the information that you hear, you know, that type of thing. Um, in addition to that, Let's see here, learning about the platform. Yeah, and, and learn how to tell, you know, stories through your content. If you work on all of those things, then th that's going to get you further than anything else that 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 you do uh, because those are the, the, the requirements for the job. Now, of course, you do have channels where, you know, they just walk around on their phone. They don't even make like thumbnails, anything like that, and those blow up too. Those blow up because of the story, right? Because the person's ability to tell a really good story. Um, they blow up because there's something unique, right? Like the cowboy guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but in his particular case, he's unique to look at. He's sitting out in his barn, the way that he communicates. He's an amazing storyteller. Uh, everything about it is just you click on his videos and you just sit there and you're just engrossed in what it is that this guy's talking about. So even though it might look like people aren't putting effort into what it is that they're doing, there's an aspect of it or aspects of it that are taking it to the level of, you know, 
being really good content. It's not about what it looks like. It's about how people are feeling when they're watching it and about how they're experiencing what it is that you're doing. So focus on those things, okay? Now, in addition to that, another thing is uh, you also, let's get into the tactical stuff. So as you're learning these things, some things that you need to make sure that, that you're thinking about, if you're trying to get more views, you're trying to get more subscribers, is the very first thing is your video topics. Your video topics are the keys to the kingdom, right? In terms of if people are going to, you know, even be interested or not. So when you make a thumbnail and you make a title, those are great. And you can make amazing thumbnails and titles, but if the topic itself isn't something that people are interested in, then you're just cutting yourself off before you even get a chance. So because of that, it's really important to make sure that the content that you're making, that there is some interest. Now, if you're making something completely unique, like let's say, for example, you're one of those channels that are doing like stick figure animations or something like that, and you're just telling really relatable stories through those. In that particular case, it's a little bit, you know, different in terms of, you know, how do I help people recognize this is about something that they care about on a homepage when you're using like a white thumbnail with like a stick figure, <laughs> right? So it's a little bit different there, but those types of things usually stand out anyway, because, you know, it is so simple. But the idea is that you just want to make sure that you are, uh, you know, actively working on, okay, if I'm going to make a video about this, then do I think that there's a lot of people that would actually be interested in this? Or am I just making this video because it's something that I want to make? You want to make the stuff that you want to make, but, but if you really want to, you know, get traction, you also have to make sure that you're making content that the people that you're trying to reach are actually interested in. Next. Um, once you do that and you consistently do that, then you're going to start noticing, okay, when I publish videos about these types of things, I get a thousand views. When I publish videos about these types of things, I get a hundred views. Uh, when I do these types of things uh, with my thumbnails and my titles, I get, you know, a couple hundred views. When I do these types of things with my thumbnails and titles, I get, you know, thousands of views. And you're going to start noticing these things over time. So pay attention to those things because they are the path, right? When you have those things that break out and people are responding to those better, try doing something similar. And the reason that you want to do that is because you're testing against the audience that's responding to that content because you're like, okay, they responded to this. So if I make something similar, let's see if they respond to that or if this was just kind of like a one-off, right? Um, then once you figure out what it is that they respond to, then you just start tweaking everything and fine tuning everything in terms of, okay, now that I know what they respond to, and now that I'm getting more familiar with this audience that I'm trying to reach, cause you know, that part's also super important. You got to know who it is that you're making content for. But now that I'm getting familiar with this audience that I'm trying to reach and I'm starting to resonate with them more, let me make sure that I'm fully embedded, if possible, around the type of content that you make. Let me make sure that I'm fully embedded in the communities. If you're a gamer around a particular game, you should be in subreddits around that game. You should be on Discord servers around that game. Um, you should be anywhere, anywhere where there's a community around that game, you should be in there and not necessarily, you can participate if you want, but you should be watching. What are people talking about? What are they? What do they care about? When updates are talk, when updates are coming up, what are the things that they're talking about in terms of things that they might be looking for? When an update drops, what are the things people are complaining about? And just starting to get really in tune with all the different aspects about the people that you're that you're trying to reach. And if you're somebody, even like you know, little crafty nooks in here. So like in you know her case, right? It's like you're doing you know craft related things. So because of that, you know, and I know that you are you know um, actively engaged in you know, crafting groups and things like that, the same exact thing applies. What problems are people having that I can help them solve? Um, you know, the people that are interacting with, uh, you know, crafts that are doing similar crafts that I am, what other types of crafts are those people talking about? Those types of things. Uh, but when you better understand the audience, then that helps you be able to make better content for them as well. And then from there, you're really resonating with the audience, you're publishing content, you figured out the content that they enjoy, you're slowly tweaking things to help them better recognize your videos, you're coming up with better video ideas, all that. Then you start thinking, okay, if I have a video that I publish, then in that particular case, I'm kind of, you know, betting everything on that one video. And on that particular video, maybe somebody can come in and they can watch that one video. Um, but at the end of that video, where am I going to send them to? So you want to make sure that you start getting really strategic about for the next step about where is it that I'm going to send people or recommend what videos am I going to recommend somebody watches once they're finished with my content and how can I start mapping all of that out? So what you start doing at that point is instead of making video, 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 you start going with a wider view and you start saying, okay, 
um, while I'm publishing these videos, instead of thinking of the videos that I'm publishing as like one video, I'm gonna start thinking in series. So I'm gonna start thinking, okay, uh, I'm gonna publish four videos on this particular thing. And I'm gonna start putting those videos in a playlist and then all of the videos in that playlist are gonna be sending viewers into that same playlist as well so that you're basically constantly feeding that playlist and the other videos in that playlist with the other related videos that are in that playlist as well, right? And then you start doing that type of thing more. So the whole idea is that as you start, you know, getting tuned in and with your skill sets, uh, with the content you're publishing and understanding what people respond to, um, and you start getting more familiar with your audience, then you start thinking of, okay, how can I, you know, through linking your content up, what you're really doing there is you're saying, how can I make an amazing resource for the people that are interacting with my type of content? That's it. And how can I, how can I make that resource as good for those people as I possibly can? And then you just rinse and repeat that uh, and then tweak along the way very long answer to that, but hopefully that made sense. Uh, Tan going the kitchen. Super chat. Thanks to super chat says, uh, I up, I started uploading two times a week plus shorts and some of them got quite a few views, but the last video didn't gain any traction, uh, traction. Why did that happen? First thing I recommend that you do is think about the topic, right? Um, next thing that I recommend you do is, uh, go in and look at the audience retention on that particular video, um, and see how it compares to the retention on the videos in the past. Next, next thing you want to do is when you're in your audience retention report, you want to click the drop down um, that says absolute retent or it says audience retention. You want to click that drop down and change it to compared to other videos. And you just want to see how that video is competing retention wise against other videos of similar length on YouTube. In addition to that, you want to go into the traffic sources report and you want to compare um, around similar impressions from the videos that have done well on the channel. You want to compare your click through rate on the different traffic sources of YouTube. And you also want to understand where you're getting traffic from on that video. Um, and the reason, let me pin this one to the screen real quick. And the way, and the reason that you want to do all this is because Sometimes when videos do well, um, they do well because, you know, they're getting tons of traffic on the homepage or because they did really well in search or, you know, you had some website pick you up and they shared your video and things like that. When you go into your traffic sources report, then you can start also understanding where the traffic comes from, where the views come from. And then in addition to that, it also helps you be able to identify like, okay, um, on homepages, compared to the impressions that I have, when this video had a similar amount of impressions, I was getting this type of click-through rate on the homepage. And you might find that like, okay, well, maybe my problem and the reason this video isn't doing as well is because it's just underperforming in the main places where I typically get views from. So, you know, my click-through rate might be inflated from, you know, maybe my channel page or, you know, something like that or search even or whatever. But when it comes to getting into the traffic sources report, it helps you get a better understanding of the details of how people are responding to what it is that you're doing. You can also see your average view duration and, you know, things related to the retention of your video there too. So uh, basically dig in and, you know, try to figure that out. And all that is, is a mirror, right? So there's nothing that you can do to that particular video outside of changing the thumbnail and title to, to change the expectation that somebody might have, you know, going into the video. But um, that's a reflection. So what you want to think about is, okay, if people responded this way, why do I think that is, right? If they didn't respond as well to the other, con to this one as they did the other content. And then uh, from there, then, you know, that's where you start taking guesses, essentially. And you're like, okay, well, I think maybe it was this part of the video. Maybe I talked too long in the intro. Maybe I uh, had some promotional message and a lot of people left during that. Maybe I, uh, you know, maybe I said something that was complicated and I didn't use just kind of easy to understand natural language. Maybe I used some kind of industry lingo around the type of content you make or something like that. I mean, in your case, you're doing stuff in the kitchen. So, I mean, it's food related. I'm, you know, guessing in that particular case. So it's probably not, you know, too much lingo that you could use there, I wouldn't think, but maybe. Um, so, you know, because of that, like maybe, maybe you, and this is gonna sound ridiculous, but you know, if you're a US creator, maybe you are using our measurement system instead of the measurement system that, you know, everybody else in the world uses. And because of that, um, internationally, it made your content not perform as well. So technically you can dig in and see that sort of thing too. But like all of these little details um, are ways that you can, you know, start to unravel how, or not how, but why you think people responded in a certain way. And then in the next videos that you publish, you kind of try to patch up those holes and then you publish another video with the theories that you have and then see how people respond to that one. And then you rinse and repeat. So hopefully that made sense. 
So next up on the list, hold on real quick. Let me take another sip of coffee here. I woke up at like seven and eight. No, it was, yeah, it was around 7 a.m. today. So, uh, <clears throat> so I'm not as, I'm, I'm not as like fresh as I uh, normally am here when I wake up at, you know, like, t you know, noon uh, when I'm doing these streams. <laughs> if you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. All right. Here we go. So uh, next up, we've got. Did I do the tube shala here? Yeah, we did. We went on, we went down a rabbit hole in that one. Okay, so next up on our list here, we've got Fit Dads uh, K R D S. They do biweekly content. The type of channel currently focuses on Pokemon trading cards. The goal of the channel to share ideas with others who share my passion. The question is, for a creator that has some experience on YouTube already with failure mainly due to inconsistency and is preparing to start a new channel from scratch, what do you recommend that they focus on most to get the channel started? The channel will either focus on gaming, news, and some live streaming, um, or it will focus or be focused around the Star Wars universe or the Game of Thrones universe. Open your recommendation on which one to pick as well. Thanks, Nick. I've been away for a while, but I'm back and ready to give this another shot. So uh, when it comes to starting a new channel from scratch, the very first thing that I would do is figure out why I'm doing it in the first place. One of the things that can impact consistency, I mean, outside of just being busy or whatever, uh, one of the things that can impact consistency is people can lose interest. So it's really important to have a reason that you are doing the YouTube channel. So the very first thing I would do is I'd be like, okay, why am I doing another channel in the first place? What is it that I'm trying to accomplish with this channel that isn't necessarily related to views and subscribers? Because everybody knows we want to get views. Everybody knows we want play buttons. Everybody knows that, you know, we want all that stuff. But, but like outside of those things, like what is it that you actually, you know, are trying to do with your YouTube channel? Um, I would get really clear on that. The next thing, once you get clear on that, that will help you answer the question on if you should do Star Wars content or gaming content. Uh, once you get clear on that question of why it is that you're that you're that you're doing this. The next thing is once you figure out which piece of you know what type of content you're going to do. The next thing I would do is I would go really deep on trying to understand the people that are consuming that content. Go watch other videos of successful creators that are doing it. Pay really close attention to their videos and pay really close attention to all oh, that's your other channel. Okay. Pay really close attention to, uh, you know, all of the nuances of their videos instead of like first watch it as a viewer, right? Like, okay, I'm going to watch this video. I'm going to see how they, you know, do everything. I'm going to see if I enjoy it. I'm going to kind of see where I get bored, that kind of stuff. Then go through and start watching it as a, uh, as a student of sorts to where you go in, <clears throat> excuse me, you go in and you start being like, okay, what did they say in the hook? Why do I think they said that in the hook? Why do I think their viewers probably responded well to this? Um, and start looking for those types of nuances. Are they doing anything to kind of shake up the viewer's attention as the video kind of, you know, starts getting going? Are they using anything in the video that uh, that could, you know, kind of add to what it is that they are doing as well? Um, is there anything that you're that you notice on the viewer side that where you got bored or something like that that you thought that they could have done better? Um, you want to start taking notes on all that stuff so that you can and you want to do this across all the channels in that niche, all the channels that are getting the views. You want to do all that so that you can start saying, okay, well, if people are responding to this and these are the, you know, channels that are kind of running the space, then in that particular case, I should probably, you know, take all these things in, into consideration when I'm putting my videos together too. Um, in addition to that, you want to look at the topics of things that they talk about. You want to look and see what's consistently worked across the channels in that niche. You can just go to the popu popular tab and look for it there. In addition to that, um, go to the videos tab and then, you know, sort by popular. Um, in addition to that, sort by recent and then go in there and just look over the past 90 days or so, maybe six months and just see, okay, recently what content has popped, right? What content has seems to do better on all these different channels. Um, and the reason that you want to do that as well is because you're looking for opportunities. So if I'm going to start publishing videos, I don't know if you were here for it when I mentioned it earlier in terms of how to get views on YouTube, but gauging interest in the things that you're talking about is a really big part of it. So what you're doing here is you're going through and you're starting to get an understanding of like, okay, these are the videos that the successful channels in this space are publishing. These are the things that they're talking about. These are the ways they're talking about them, all that. So these are proven things that people are interested in. And the reason you want to do that is so that when you publish your videos that you just have proof that like, okay, these are at least things that I know that there's a market for. Next, go and look at all their thumbnails, see what they're doing with their thumbnails. And another thing I recommend you do too is compare your thumbnails, like make some thumbnails, come up with just some random video ideas of videos that you might make and then make some thumbnails for them. And when you're making those thumbnails, literally download one of their thumbnails and then sit there and look at them side by side and be like, okay, 
why, what about their thumbnail would stand out against mine, right? And start trying to figure out how to make really good thumbnails like they're making as well, right? Also look at how they're structuring their titles, look at little things. Like for example, if you were looking at my content, you would see that I'm using YouTube logos in my thumbnails. You would see that in my title, I, I use my face a lot, especially when I first publish a video. Then I'll, you know, test it later or whatever. And then you'll see also, um, you know, that I use the word YouTuber or new YouTuber or content creator, you know, all the time in my titles and or thumbnails. This thumbnail and the, the live stream that you're watching right now has something like, you know, content creators only or creators only or something like that in it with a big YouTube logo. And the whole idea there is, you know, again, just to help people identify that it's, you know, for them. Uh, but, you know, you want to look for all of those little details, again, within the space that you're getting ready to go compete. In. And the reason for that is because it is a competition. So you are publishing videos and you if you want views, you have to be able to compete with the other people that are that are making content, you don't want to come in and be like, Okay, I'm starting this channel. And I just want to get you know, the minimum amount of you know, activity possible, you want to say, Okay, I at least want to hit you know, certain thresholds with this. So because of that, I need to understand what is behind those, you know, thresholds that response that 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 people are getting on the videos. And you do that through studying those channels. Ty's Hot Mess History, what is going on? Hope that you are doing fantastic. Welcome to the stream. Uh, let's see here. So next up on the list, we've got the Dr. Vibe Show, trademarked, by the way. <laughs> they, 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 they put the little TM in there just to make sure, right? Uh, the type of channels to educate, the goal of the channels to educate, empower, enlighten, and educate black people. Um, and to monetize. The question is, congrats on getting, congratulations on getting engaged. Thank you. Um, is it a good idea to put hashtags in the YouTube title and in the description? Put them in the description, not the title. Uh, and yeah, really quick, by the way, if you, if you weren't here at the very beginning of the stream, um, I got engaged uh, over, because I was away you know, last week, so we went to Japan for nine days and uh, uh, got engaged while I was there. So I just wanted to you know, just share that awareness. So you can congratulate me. <laughs> Uh, but just kind of spreading the word because it's pretty cool. Never done that before. So uh, pretty excited about it. Uh, Learn Spanish World. Hey, thanks for the, uh, for the message here. It says, hey, Nick, uh, just checking if YouTube can list unwatched videos from a channel, maybe like newest to popular or oldest. Um, no, like if, if you, wait, unwatched videos. No, basically if you have it like on your own channel, then in that case, like you are like, if, if nobody's watched it, then there's nothing to really list, right? Because there wouldn't be anything that's popular if it's, you know, if it's, uh, you know, if it's, you know, unlisted, you can list oldest, but, uh, oops, sorry here. Just making sure I've got your, uh, question here. YouTube can list unwatched videos from a channel. No, if they're, if they're unwatched, then, uh, then yeah, like, uh, you, like you wouldn't even be able to tell who is popular. Or which videos was popular? Super Thank chat. you for the super chat. Learn Spanish world. I appreciate it. Um, let's see here. So next up on the list. Thank you for the uh, congratulations messages. I appreciate it. I mean, I was kind of fishing for them, <laughs> but I appreciate it. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so next up, uh, we've got. Um, let's see here. Where did you visit? Um, yeah, I, I went to Japan and I see you're in the Philippines. I've been to the Philippines a bunch of times too. I'm over in Thailand. So, I mean, we're practically neighbors, you know, on a global scale. Uh, but yeah, I've been to the Philippines a bunch too, but yeah, this last trip, I just went to, uh, I just went to Japan. Uh, the next channel here is English fun zone. Uh, they upload one time per week or more. The type of channel is English education as a second language. The goal of the channel is fun English videos for students learning English and to make a little money doing it. The question is, is there a link for member only join? I want people to be able to click on a link and they automatically see my members only videos and be able to join from there. Yes. So if you go into your monetization settings, um, give me one second and I will navigate this on oh, my mouse is down. So no, I won't. Uh, I might be able to do it quickly here really quick. But if you go into your uh, monetization settings, then you will be able to, let's see, I'll walk through it here real quick. Click into uh, your monetization settings, click on memberships. And then I believe it's over in the sidebar. Hold on really quick. Yeah, it's over in the sidebar. Um, if you scroll down the, the page over on the right-hand side, 
then it gives you links to share. So you have invite viewers to join your channel and then share your members only videos. So yeah, you've, uh, you, you definitely have that in there. Uh, let's see here. Rhea Taurus. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. Says, for several reasons, I use Patreon instead of YouTube membership. Could this be affecting the algorithm? That is the way YouTube shows my content? No. No. So, like, uh, uh, YouTube, basically, the thing that matters when it comes to YouTube is how viewers respond to your content. If you have memberships enabled or not, is not going to impact your performance on the platform. If you're sending people to Patreon, technically, people are leaving your videos to go to Patreon, but it's not happening at a rate that is going to negatively impact the videos, you know, either. So because of that, yeah, there, there's, there's, no, there's no worries there at all. Um, let's see here. Next up, we got Magic Prepper. Super Chat. Thanks to Super Chat. Says, uh, congratulations on your engagement, Nick. I wish the best for both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty awesome, actually. Super Amazing chat. Out Destinations, thank you for the super chat there uh, as well and the congratulatory message. I appreciate it. Berto Blake, my man. What's going on, Berto? Hope you're doing awesome. Says, uh, glad to see you're back, Nick. Hope that you're having a good evening over there. I am indeed. Berto Blake, ladies and gentlemen, is the author. I didn't bring uh, Brian's out uh, when he swung by here, but Berto Blake, just in case you're not familiar the author of Create Something Awesome book here. You can find this on Amazon. I've got a link down in the video description as well, uh, but it shares how creators are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. So make sure that you check that out. And, and he didn't swing in here for like a plug or anything, but I always like to, you know, bring, you know, that extra, you know, put that extra light on buddies. <laughs> but uh, in addition to that, he also helps content creators as well, has a, has a mountain of uh, content over on his channel. For content creators, especially those of you, how I did my rant earlier about going full time on YouTube. Um, uh, for those of you that are interested in that, you definitely should be, you know, following Roberto's content as well because he talks about, you know, that kind of stuff all the time. Also, one of the things that I get asked about um, quite a bit is an analytics video. People ask me, you know, hey Nick, do you have a, a, a like a deep dive on YouTube analytics? And I do not have that uh, on my YouTube channel. Roberto does. He's got like, a, I think it's like a four or five hour live stream that he did where he just goes through everything step by step and shares, you know, all the details inside of YouTube analytics and, uh, and goes into detail about, you know, how you can use them and how to interpret what it is that you're seeing and all of that. Um, so you can find all of that over on his channel. So make sure that you uh, go over there and you subscribe to him too. Uh, little crafty Nook says, congrats to you, Kev Goes. My husband had never been married before. We got married four years ago. He was 64. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm coming in a little bit late myself. <laughs> so uh, next up on our list here, we've got Gregory Sesma. Gregory Sesma, um, they upload one time per week or more. They do speed drawing and animation. The goal of the channel is to share my art with others, build a community, and to get monetized. The question, I'm getting close to 900 subscribers for my channel. What actions can I take to make sure that I keep growing and get lots of watch time? So just... Pay attention to how people are responding to your videos and modify accordingly. So pay attention to how people are responding to your videos, publish on a regular basis, not just so that you can keep, you know, hitting YouTube with content, but so that you can keep, you know, giving your viewers what it is that they want, which is great content from you. And also so that you can just work the process of consistently making content into your lifestyle. Um, because, you know, it's easy to do for a couple of weeks, you know, when you're fired up and motivated and all that stuff. But once you get used to it and it becomes the normal for you, then in that particular case, if you don't have it worked in to your lifestyle in a way that makes it possible to continually do the thing, then it, it can become challenging because then the motivation doesn't come from your excitement over doing the thing. Um, it, it has to come from somewhere else. So when you build that system into your lifestyle, it makes it possible to, you know, continually make content for long periods of time. So I would, I would focus on that. Um, in addition to that, um, also start paying attention because you're at 900 subscribers now. So if that came from long form, then I'm guessing, you know, you're starting to, you know, pay attention to the things that you make that people typically respond to better than others. Uh, so make sure that you do, you know, start paying attention to those types of things in your channel. Do more of what people respond to more, less of things that they, that they do not. Also, keep in mind that every video that you publish to your channel does not have to be, you know, a, a banger, so to speak, um, if it is published for a purpose. So part of content strategy, um, you're going to hear that, you know, a lot as a content creator. Part of content strategy is, is having intention behind what it is that you do and making sure that every video 
video that you publish has a specific job. So that job can be, hey, these videos typically drive more subscribers to my channel. That job can be this type of video usually drives revenue, um, off-platform revenue. That job can be this type of video usually gets more um, uh, ad revenue um, or higher CPMs on it, so I usually make more money when I make these types of videos. Um, that that intention could be, uh, you know, I need to publish this video. I actually have a thing in my content calendar that specifically says this. I need to publish this video because people need to hear this, <laughs> right? So I have, I have that in my, in my content calendar. So it's like I'm making this one just because people need to hear it. Um, um, so like when it comes to your content, just make sure that you are being intentional about what it is that you're publishing and that each video does have a very specific job or goal that you're trying to accomplish with that particular video. Uh, let's see here. So next up, we've got Tough Bass. Tough Bass, they do outdoor content. The goal of the channel, love the name. The, out, uh, the type of channel is an outdoor channel. The goal of the channel is to make it my full-time career which I have so far, nice work. Uh, the question is, Nick, hope you're well. A brand reached out and wants to do a test promotion before offering a long-term paid sponsorship. For example, they send me some products, I put an ad slot in my videos for the next month, and I try to get my audience to use my discount code. Depending on the amount of discount codes used may lead to a long-term partnership. Do you have any strategy you would recommend other than the ad slots in my videos? Okay. So first, you know, of course, they're going to want you know, people to use that coupon code so that you know, they can make sales. Um, make sure that when they send you those products, that they are of a value that you, that is worth it to you. Um, when it comes to brand deals, there, um, a lot of companies take advantage of content creators. There's no like easy way to do that one. So a lot of companies take advantage of content creators by sending them low value products in exchange for the exposure. So that exposure could be. Uh, you know, their name mentioned in your thing, you sending clicks to their website to where they have more expensive things to sell, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's really, I, I'm not going to say common, but it definitely happens way more than it should, where content creators will work for essentially free, or in some cases take a loss in order to promote something. Um, some Brands will do what they're doing here to where they will say, hey, if this one goes well, then we will do more with you. And that's understandable, right? Some people will do that um, maliciously. Other people will do that legitimately to where they're like, hey, we just want to see if your audience responds to our stuff or not. So because of that, just make sure that you are you know, aware of all those things. But um, one thing that, that you need to make sure that you do if you're trying to bring awareness to those products is make content that supports that awareness. So you're doing outdoors content. So different approaches that you can take. The very first one is that you, you know, have your content, you're doing outdoors content, you're trying to, you know, do something and you're like, okay, I'm trying to, you know, pitch this tent or whatever. Tent's probably a bad example. I'm trying to make this fire. And, uh, you know, with this fire, um, uh, you know, normally I would do this, but I didn't bring it with me. But hey, I do have this, you know, in the car or whatever, or hey, I just brought this with me and this is what I use, you know, and you spread awareness about it that way, you can do that. Um, but you do it as part of the other content, right, out, out of the other stuff that you do. Um, the other approach is that you make a dedicated video bringing awareness about that particular product. Now, in some cases, this fits, in other cases, it doesn't. So you have to identify if this is right for you or not. But the difference is, if you make a video where you just happen to include it, and, you know, you, like a quick passing mention, like, oh, yeah, we got to make this fire. I'm making it with this. This is what I use for this. I got this available down in the description. Quick mention, let people know about it. Let them know, you know, a little bit early in the video so that they can, you know, see it, see you using it, that kind of stuff. Plus, more people are watching, you know, there at the beginning uh, or, you know, earlier in the video. But, um, but basically bringing awareness, you know, to that thing in the video. Um, people, when they click on that video, they're expecting to watch content about the outdoors, not necessarily about that thing. So because of that, you can still generate sales, um, and maybe a lot. But the intent when somebody clicks on that video isn't to purchase or learn about something that they might purchase. So because of that, your conversion might be a little bit lower. Now, if you make something dedicated, like a review of that thing or a list of, you know, hey, if you're going camping, these are, you know, eight different things that you, that I, you know, you must have these eight things when you go camping. And then you have that, you know, somewhere on that list. Then in that particular case, the people that are clicking on that video are expecting products to be shown to them 
and therefore their intent is just a little bit higher in terms of, you know, like, oh, hey, you know, if I see something in this list, I might actually hop on Amazon or go to their that company's website and buy it, okay? Then from there, the next step up is that you make a dedicated video that's like a review of that thing and you search target that video. Um, and in that particular case, that's a little bit of a slow burn video. And with a slow burn video, the thing with that is like at the time of publish, it might not do that great. It might. And you can double dip to um, in terms of making it for the recommendation system, but make sure that you do have it, you know, optimized for search in terms of, you know, keywords, things like that. But basically the thing with search is if people are looking for information about that product, then your video, if you do like a review, for example, then they could find your video there as long as your video performs well for that particular search term. And then that way it can drive them a lot of traffic over time. Um, and then in addition to that, you could also go the route in terms of like, okay, I'm trying to get attention to this from the homepage and so that I can get, you know, those sales quicker. And then in that case, you would use the same thing that I mentioned earlier with this mouse where I did the example of like, if you were search targeting this versus you were trying to get attention to it, you know, from a homepage to where, you know, if you're trying to get attention from a homepage with this particular mouse, because it's got all these extra buttons on it and stuff, then in that case, you know, making a video about this mouse increase my productivity by X percent or something like that is going to be more likely to get a response within the recommendation system, because then people, you know, are, are on YouTube. And if they're interested in productivity in any uh, capacity, then that would be a relevant to them. So, um, so basically packaging the video up that way for uh, recommendations, make one of those two so that you can, you know, get basically the fast sales with recommendation systems, the slow but consistent sales with uh, YouTube search, and then making sure that you are putting out combinations of videos as long as your content type supports it and how you do things on your channel to where you're mixing in like reviews, you're mixing it into just the regular videos uh, that you're putting together. Um, you're putting in list videos, you can compare it against other things that are similar, that kind of stuff. So hopefully that helped. You'll see that on my content. Like if, if you watch my stuff, right? Like I'll do things, I even do it in live streams. To where, uh, to where, you know, like if I'm talking about something, um, I'll just make like little quick mentions of things. Like, for example, earlier in the stream today, and it wasn't intentional, it just kind of happened, you know, in the moment to where, you know, I'm like thinking about, like I'm, I'm explaining something. I'm like, hey, this would be a good fit right here. So I'll, I'll drop it right here. Um, but I mentioned Opus Clip for something earlier in the stream today. Um, and I'm kind of doing it right now, but again, not intentionally. But basically, uh, you know, those types of things are to where, you know, you also start spreading like a little bit of awareness kind of here and there about it. And then as a part of that, I also have, if you go down to my video descriptions, this is another thing that you can do as well. And you can put this in all of your video descriptions. So if you're a TubeBuddy user, see, I'm doing it again, but, but again, not intentionally, but it just kind of works this way, right? But like if you're a TubeBuddy user, they have a bulk update tool. It's a find and replace tool. And you can basically put the blurb that you want, put a space above it, make a little blurb that says like, you know, must have, you know, my, my favorite outdoor products favorite products for doing whatever outdoors find like, you know, five or 10 products that you support, um, have a link to those products, put what it is that, you know, they actually do, um, and actually support the products, make sure they're good products. Cause if you recommend stuff and it's not good, people aren't going to take your recommendations later. So basically you put that block down in your uh, video descriptions, put it into two buddies, find and replace if you're a two buddy user. Um, and then you basically can put that into all the descriptions across your entire channel, but you put that block in your video descriptions. And then for the people that go down there, um, for other things, they will see that little block of like your recommendations of, you know, the things that you recommend, uh, uh that people that are into the outdoors get. And, um, and it's in that list too. So you can do that kind of stuff too. But basically, you know, just working those things in any way that you can and bringing awareness to it, saying something else that is relevant to the viewer. And then also, you know, within that, letting them know that that thing is in the description. So for example, um, uh, and we're kind of like getting, you know, kind of into the weeds with this, but I'm just wanting to share this, you know, with everybody. Um, but basically, uh, basically the idea is like, uh, oh man, what was I going to say with that one? Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought on that one. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll come back to me if it's important, but anyway, just, just trying to spread all those little, uh, you know, nuggets, so to speak, um, of awareness for it. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. So let's say you're making your next video and let's say you add those blocks to all of your video descriptions and you add it kind of towards the top because it would be a priority because it's, it actually has benefit to you. 
So you'd put it higher up in your video description. So you would have your blurb of what, it, you know, your paragraph of what the video is about. Then you would have the, you know, tools that you recommend or your outdoor tools that you recommend. So another thing that you can do is while you're making your video, you can say, uh, and you do this while you're putting the video together, have a moment in your video to where you give yourself the opportunity to mention another video on your YouTube channel. Then tell them, I've got a link to that down in the description if you want to check that out. And then by doing that, you're doing the same exact thing to where you're actively trying to get people to go down to look in your description. So they will find that video down there. But while they're on the way down, they will have the option to see those other things that you recommend as well. So all of those little types of things um, can really add up. Like, you know, Roberto said here, it's super effective. Um, like all of those little things can like really, you know, add up over time. Next, the anxious stepmom. Uh, they upload one time per week or more. Uh, they've been making content for less than six months. If you're enjoying the show, remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now. They do educational content. The goal of the channel is to help step moms navigate this unique role with greater ease and joy. Uh, the question is, I'm planning to start live streaming weekly via StreamYard, sharing on a, see, it just happened again. <laughs> Share, that one wasn't me, though, it was somebody else. Uh, sharing on a topic uh, relevant to stepmoms and then opening it up to questions. How can I optimize for replay viewers? I notice you use similar thumbnail and title for your weekend live streams. Would you recommend this? So the reason I do that, that for these live streams is because I am trying to add value to the people that are actively interacting with my content. So, you know, for you guys that are here, um, most of you are watching my videos on a somewhat regular basis. You don't watch all of them, but you watch, you know, my videos on a regular basis. Um, in addition to that, some of you just come in here, like you don't even watch videos, um, but you just come in here. So my thing with these streams, with Nimmin Live specifically, is to answer questions that either one, I don't have videos about, two, to help get into the nuance of like a problem that you're having, three, just to, you know, give back through that personalized, you know, service, so to speak, um, to, you know, you guys that are actively interacting with what it is that I'm doing. So because of that, this particular stream isn't for growth. This stream is for connection and for adding value. That's why I also, you know, reserved sharing my engagement for this live stream instead of, you know, posting it on Twitter and stuff, um, which I will do later. I'll share it probably on, you know, Twitter and things like that later. But, you know, like, like the, the, you know, you guys here in the live stream are, you know, are, 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 you know, my crew, so to speak, right? Like, uh, you know, we see each other, you know, every week. Um, I'm answering your questions all the time, you know, all of that stuff. Um, a lot of you, you know, like I, I either know you by name um, or, you know, I know you by channel name. Some of us have met um, and hung out at, you know, Vid Summit, um, stuff like that. So, you know, like that's what this stream is for. Um, when it comes to the other streams, like the monetization streams that I do, those particular streams, the, the purpose of that um, is one, to provide something completely different, but those do gain subscribers, but it um, but it's to provide something completely different because everybody does channel reviews now, but nobody's on monetization reviews. So because of that, I'm like, hey, let's introduce something here. Um, in addition to that, that also gives an extra sponsor placement when I get those sponsored. Um, and two, I'm also working on a course and part of that course is monetization. So once I get that, you know, published, then that particular live stream will become a regular thing, kind of like Nimmin Live is, and I'll be doing those more. And that's also going to be used as part of a mechanism to spread awareness about that particular thing. And the long game of that is that particular stream, it also demonstrates my understanding of how to make money from content, right? So it has multiple purposes in that regard. My news live streams um, that I was doing, those also grew the channel. And with those, I was able to add value, you know, to the viewers and keep people, you know, up to date with what was going on. The long game with that was even people that subscribed to my channel 10 years, not 10 years, uh, eight years ago that don't watch these videos anymore or that don't watch like my how to get views videos and stuff like that anymore because they're, they're you know, they understand it now um, as a way to also bring them back to the channel and also as a way to keep myself 
you know, just making sure that I'm, you know, just right on top of it as everything's happening. Um, uh, it was for that, you know, as well. And as a way that as people were finding my content as a way to keep them coming back is at least that particular resource. So if I publish a video on a tool, and they don't, they're not looking for that, it's fine, right? If I publish a video on how to get views, and they're in their past that, that's fine, too. But people want to stay up to date with like what's happening in, in the industry. So because of that, you know, that was also part of that. So those were designed to grow the channel. So with those being designed to grow the channel, I packaged them up, you know, differently. I, pa I did package them up so people could recognize them so that they would, you know, come back in for them. Um, and in addition to that, I intentionally formatted those streams to be as long as they needed to be to share the information that creators needed. And then that was it. So it wasn't like I was hanging out for an hour talking about the news unless it was something big, like when YouTube dropped their creator music, and it's a total mess. Um, then I spent like 30 minutes on that particular one just explaining it going through the rules, all that stuff to spread awareness about that. But the idea that I'm trying to share is that with those particular streams, they were short, some of those streams were five minutes long. Um, some of them were, you know, uh, 10 minutes long, around 10 minutes was the, you know, average, like 10, 12, eight, you know, around there. Um, and then I had an occasional long one if something like really big happened. Um, but the idea is to, if you're doing it for the sake of growing your YouTube channel, that's what I'm getting to. Um, if you're streaming for the sake of growing your YouTube channel, then make sure that you're doing streams that grow your YouTube channel and make sure that you are doing everything uh, differently. So when you're packaging up your live stream, instead of doing it as you know a template like I do on these streams, package it just like you would a video. So if you're gonna be talking about something in that live stream, package it up in a way that will help people that you're trying to reach identify that that particular live stream is about something that they care about. Do not optimize it around a show name or anything like that. Optimize it around topics. If you optimize it around a show name, then people have to be familiar with the show to care. Um, if you optimize it around a topic, everybody interested in that topic becomes a candidate for that particular video or of, of having an interest for that particular video. When it comes to the optimizing it for replay viewers, once the stream is complete, well, first, make sure that the format is right in terms of right when the stream starts, you know, you you give them what it is that you're gonna be doing in that stream, and then you start delivering the content of exactly what it is that you promised people that you're gonna be doing in that stream. Um, in addition to that, let me switch to a different uh, brand thing here. Another thing that you can do is right here, if you want to do all the, you know, live stream, uh, like hangout stuff, right? Like, you know, hey, welcome to stream and, you know, blah, blah, you know, and just, you know, shouting people out, that kind of stuff. Then in that particular case, do that. But if you are going to optimize it for the replay, you want to have a period in your live stream to where you add a cut point. All you have to do for this is you say the words, oh, and if you're just joining us, pause for a second and say, today we're talking about blah, blah, blah. And then you, you basically add your hook after you say, if you're just joining us, right? And you add that pause. And then the reason that you add that pause is if you look at this graphic right here, where it says cut point, you can go into YouTube's editor and you have all of that hangouty live stream stuff at the beginning. And then for the replay, you go in to YouTube's editor and you're gonna lose the live stream chat when you do this, which also makes it feel like a video experience. So you're going to go into YouTube's editor and at that cut point where you have that brief pause after you say, if you're just joining us, today we're talking about blah, 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 right? That space in between us and today or whatever it is that you say there, that's where you cut it in YouTube's editor. And then the replay experience is a viewer clicks on the video and you're saying, today we're talking about blah, 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 or whatever it is that you say there, you know, for your hook. So the idea is to just go through and repackage it for, you know, for those viewers that are going to be having that um, experience by being intentional about how you're actually formatting the entire stream. Same exact thing applies to once they get to the end of the video. If you make mentions to other videos, things like that, you can add cards if you want to, um, that sort of thing to make it, you know, a real, you know, as much of a video like experience, uh, you know, as you can there. Hopefully that helped. Next. We've got Build with Mooney. Build with Mooney uploads when they have time. 
Uh, DIY woodworking content. The goal is to share and teach. The question is, my son-in-law made a song about my woodworking shop using AI. <laughs> nice. My question is, can I use a song made from AI on YouTube? I thought I would never ask a question like this, but very curious. Can I use it? So what you need to do is you need to look into the licensing. Um, you just need to look into the to the rules for um, the, 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 where he made the music. So if he made it, uh, you know, on a particular, you know, uh, what, what's the one, there's a new one that just dropped too. But if he, if he made it in one of those, then they're going to have like an FAQ where they'll answer this particular question. So you need to either send them an email and ask them, um, so that you can get official, you know, information from them, or you need to make sure that you find like license information on their website. It's probably going to be in the footer or it's going to be somewhere near where he downloaded the track. If he has an actual account, he can log in and, and, you know, get to that stuff. Um, but yeah, you need to actually, you know, get something official there because if you do use it and there is some type of, you know, very specific thing that they have in their license agreement in terms of, you know, free tiers, you can't use it mid tiers. You can only use it if it's this long or something like that. And then like the full enterprise tier, you can use it for everything. If they have something weird like that, then in that particular case, you'll avoid uh, any headaches. And, and make sure that you're doing it, you know, safely there. But yeah, I would definitely reach out to, uh, to them via email. Roger Wakefield in the house. What's up, my man? Hope that you're doing fantastic. Nice to see you in here. Congratulations to you for uh, getting on Dr. Phil. Absolutely awesome, dude. Saw that on your Facebook, and I was like, no way. So uh, 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 about, man, when was that? Yeah, probably about 17 years ago. Um, I was in California, and one of my brother's friends, one of these friends, um, he got tickets to Dr. Phil. And we went as an audience members. Um, I wasn't, you know, in your, your case, you know, you're, you know, you're like, you know, on Dr. Phil, but, uh, but yeah, we went as audience members and, uh, and, uh, it was sad, man. Like the, the one that we went to, they were, it was, uh, I'm not even gonna talk about it. It was, it was just sad. Like, uh, that particular one, it was basically people that were doing things irresponsibly while they were driving and they caused, you know, kind of crazy, horrible situations to happen. Uh, so it was just kind of, you know, like it was a sad one, but, uh, but, but just the experience was pretty cool. So I can imagine like on, on the other end of it. Uh, yeah, I bet that was, I bet that was absolutely awesome. And congratulations to you, uh, for that. Uh, there's another one, uh, that I saw you on too, that I saw you post. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, man, congratulations to you for, uh, for just crushing it in every way, in every way that you can crush it. Roger Wakefield is crushing it. <laughs> The next question is, uh, oh, you know what? It was uh, the dirty jobs guy. Uh, I woke up super early this morning, so my brain's not where it normally is around this time. Uh, Mike uh, Rowe, I think it was. Yeah, that was the other one. Yeah, you were hanging out with Mike Rowe uh, talking trades over there. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, awesome. So congratulations, Roger, for just all the success that you're having, man, every aspect of it. It's just absolutely amazing to watch. Love it. Uh, Rob the Maritimer is our next channel here. They upload every other day. Um, the type of channel is they make uh, tutorial videos on Camtasia. Oh, super cool. The uh, goal of Camtasia is awesome. The goal of the channel is to build a full-time income while building a community who are helped by my videos. The question, I create how-to tutorial videos that teach people how to use Camtasia. I've been uploading three videos and doing one live stream per week for the last four to five weeks and seem to have found my groove. My channel is just about or just under 3000 subscribers, but starting to grow and I'm able to keep one week of future videos ready to go in YouTube scheduling system. So I'm staying on top of it, but I'm concerned that a potential size of my audience is too limited for me to have a successful channel. Question, am I uploading videos too frequently? Does each one upload a new video take away any growth of the previous video um, that it might've had? Um, if I can generate four videos a week comfortably, would I be better off creating a second channel that could tar target another software I use like Canva and maybe do two videos per week per channel. So in terms of the content that you're gonna to publish to the channel, that particular thing is just gonna be a choice that you're gonna to have to make. Um, in terms of, you know, like doing Canva and Camtasia on the channel, if you're gonna do that, I would talk about a bunch of different tools. But one of the advantages that you're gonna have right now is if you just build out a complete resource for Camtasia, then if somebody hits your channel and they find one Camtasia video, they're extremely likely to watch a lot more of your Camtasia videos if they enjoy your teaching style, which you've been doing this for four to five weeks and you've already got 3,000 subscribers on the channel so they're absolutely enjoying what you're doing so because of that 
if it was me, um, I would do, I would just stick on Camtasia at least for a while. Um, and I would just be, you know, publishing that content. One thing that I would do though, in terms of your upload cadence is I would actually write out a list of like, okay, how many videos can I actually make about this? And then write those out and try to get, you know, a hundred videos and just see, okay, will I be able to have enough content um, and get creative, of course, different ways that you can show things and all that. But will I be able to have enough content to be able to see this through for a long period of time? And of course, as they have new updates and things like that, you're going to be able to, you know, kind of remake all the videos that you've published already. But just making sure that you are going to have enough content ideas is really important. And if you find that like, okay, I'm going to run out of ideas really fast, so I keep publishing four to five videos a week, then in that particular case, you have two choices. One, um, you might have more, but the, you know, for the sake of this, you've got two. <laughs> One is that you just get through all those videos and then you can start talking about other video editing software and other things like that. Um, and the other version is that you just say, okay, there's, you know, I'm going to run out of these super fast. So because of that, I'm going to slow down my uploads. We'll say three versions. So I'm going to throw down my, uh, slow down my uploads and, uh, and I'm going to publish at a cadence. that's going to be able to keep me, uh, consistently publishing content about this to where I can sync up with their updates right? Because they just had like Rev come out, you know, a few months ago. So like, as they push updates, then I can just start on that, on that wheel again, and just keep, you know, pushing out content about all the updates they do all the videos or new versions of the videos that you know, that I've already made that kind of stuff. Um, and then the third version would be that you would slow it down to where you start doing like, you know, a Canva video or two per week, depending on how many video ideas that you had, if you need to, to redo a Canva video or two per week, or not, I'm sorry, Camtasia video or two per week. And then um, within that, you start talking about other video related things that would also be appropriate for that audience that, you know, that, that uses Camtasia. Um, that would be, and that could be, you know, Canva or other, you know, tool related things. Um, but just experimenting and seeing like, okay, for the Camtasia users, what else, you know, would they like videos on? You can also use your community tab for this to where you start asking, you know, what other videos, uh, what other tools would you like me to show you? Um, and then basically build out, you know, pillars around those tools as well, or playlists. Uh, we'll just do it that way. Playlists around uh, those other tools. But you know, four to five weeks in, and you're already at three thousand subscribers. You're crushing it. You're doing great. So, uh, so I would definitely ride that, you know, for a while um, until you're like, okay, I just can't come up with any more ideas uh, on this. Volunteer lawn care uh, is the is the type of channel here. It's uh, Derek's Lawn Rescue is the channel name. The goal of the channel is to make money from videos uh, so that I can help as many people as possible. The question is, what are some ways other than AdSense that my channel could make money? I'm not monetized yet, um, but since I focus on volunteer work, I'm not sure what else that I can do to create an income. So the very first thing is that uh, you can absolutely set up some type of crowdfunding for what you're doing. Um, it's, I mean, you're just, you know, flooded in, you know, kindness in terms of like, you're doing something really awesome for people. And when people see people doing that sort of thing, people like to support it. So because of that, I would definitely set up some type of crowdfunding. If it's a Patreon, and as part of that Patreon, let's say you you know, uh, either publish like an additional video or you somehow get the community involved in what it is that you're doing, set goals like, hey, we're trying to, you know, generate this much so that we can help more people. We're trying to hire people to help us, that kind of stuff and get the community kind of, you know, create a movement of sorts behind what it is that you're doing through that community. Um, that would be one way. Um, another way would be to make sure that you are letting people know about the particular tools that you're using because you're using lawn mowers, you're, you're using edgers and weed trimmers and all this stuff. So letting people know that you have those things and putting links to those things down in the video description as an affiliate to either like Amazon or the Home Pro or uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever it is stores, um, you know, having uh, affiliate links down there is an, another way. Um, in addition to that, I would definitely, because what you're doing uh, is kindness and that reflects great on companies. So I would also start reaching out to brands around the products that you use and start trying to get them on board with what it is that you're doing and not just in terms of supporting you through their products, but also paying you to have those products be featured in your videos as the products that you're using to do these services. Because 
while you're doing these services and you're making those videos, because I've watched a ton of those videos, I love those videos, but while you're uh, doing those services, you're also demonstrating, one, your talent, but you're also demonstrating the tools that you're using for the job. So whatever it is that you're using for your edging or your mowing or anything like that, you're able to demonstrate that. And as a part of that, another thing that you can do to also increase the likelihood of that is if you're not doing this yet, while you're mowing the yards and doing those types of things, try to get some creative shots. Don't make it cringy. Don't like, you know, don't make it to where it's like, oh, hey, I'm trying to promote this lawnmower, but try to get some cool shots, putting GoPros, you know, maybe on like your lawnmower and stuff like that. Maybe having, you know, a GoPro attached to, you know, like the, the you know, pole of the, the thing that you're holding there to, you know, do the edging or whatever. And uh, to where it just kind of shows down, maybe it shows a logo, maybe it doesn't, but you're kind of getting some cool you know, product shots kind of along the way to where don't make it again, don't make it cringy because you don't want to take away from what it is that you're doing because what you're doing is awesome. But the reason that I'm telling you to do, to get these types of shots with the equipment that you're using is because if you reach out to a company and they see like, okay, like not only are they doing something awesome, but while they're doing something awesome, they're also, you know, showing these tools in like really cool and creative ways that they would be able to, you know, see that you'd be able to bring attention to their stuff even more. Um, uh, that would just kind of add value through their eyes in terms of you being able to bring more attention to their, uh, to their products. So I would definitely do that type of thing too, but yeah, I would definitely get on the sponsorship side of things like as fast as you possibly can. Roger Wakefield says he also hit 600,000 subscribers this week, we got a little thing popping up here. Um, this week, um, it's been such a wonderful week. Uh, thanks, Nick Newman, for all your help. So much great free advice. Um, if you do it, it works. Thanks, Roger, for the kind words. And 600,000 subscribers, man, absolutely crushing it. Like I said, man, every way that you can crush it. Like Roger is living his best life uh, in every every way. Absolutely love it, my man. Love seeing it. Looking forward to seeing you in September. Next up, we've got the Halloween uh, episodes. They're getting ready to start their channel. The type of channel is Spooky TV Recaps. The goal of the channel is to do something that I love and go full time. Uh, the question is, I'm starting a TV recap review channel focusing on nostalgic 90s and uh, thousands shows. Should I target search or browse for maximum growth? Absolutely uh, go after recommendation system without question. Yeah, because you're going to be talking about things of like high interest to people, like do some research and see if people are, you know, actively looking around for that a lot. Um, they're probably going to be looking for it more around like Halloween and stuff. But uh, but I, yeah, you would definitely be pulling attention there from from home pages uh, and suggested videos. I would definitely go for that play. Next. Little Crafty Nook. Uploading one time per week or more, doing homemade greeting cards. The goal of the channel is to teach others and earn some money. And the question is, I noticed my impressions went up drastically after I got a few comments on one particular video from 500 to 700 in a couple of hours. Is that how it works? So um, according to YouTube, um, comments don't impact your video performance. Um, what could have happened is that in addition to those comments, those people were watching the videos for a longer period of time. Um, they might have liked the videos along with those comments, those types of, you know, because that, you know, does count. So, you know, they could have been doing those types of interactions. It's also possible that some of those people, and you can see this also if you go and you look at your end screens, um, it's possible that some of those people, you know, continued watching your content after they were finished with that video, either through your end screens or YouTube suggesting it, you know, one of your videos in the up next, something like that, um, pinned comments, that kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, but that's going to come from the general response, not from the comment section itself. Um, and, and that's, you know, from YouTube. So... Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be the comments, but it was how they were actually responding to the video itself. Yeah. 50 to 700 in a, in a couple of hours. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it's, those people were engaged. So they probably liked it, commented it probably, you know, enjoyed the video also. Um, so that's probably, probably more, you know, of, of, of what caused that. Next up on our list here, we got Comics Undone. Comics Undone uploads one time per week or more. Um, they do comic knowledge and enthusiasm. The goal of the channel is to share my love of comic art and stories. The question is, when you do vertical live streams, do the views count as shorts views or regular views? Um, they count as regular views. So um, if you leave it public once it's finished, then uh, you are getting watch time. 
um, once that is a regular piece of content on YouTube. But yeah, it, it counts. It counts like a like a live stream. It, I mean, it counts just like a regular live stream does. So I don't know if they're going to change that in the future or not. But uh, but it counts just like a regular live stream. He's hot, or sorry, uh, Tom Gunn in the kitchen says, who else is having breakfast right now? I'm mixing coffee and water. So basically, this is my coffee cup. This is my water cup. And I'm mixing, uh, I'm mixing those two. It's, uh, it's almost 10 p.m. where I am. So definitely not having, uh, <laughs> definitely not having breakfast. But I mean, I'm not going to lie, though. I mean, you know, like, I wouldn't mind some pancakes right now. You know, just like some... Just like, just like a three stack, you know, nothing huge, but just like a three stack of, what would be good? Maybe some, maybe some chocolate chip pancakes. I could totally go for that right now. That'd be great. Next up, we've got uh, Pesca RD. They have a fishing channel. The goal of the channel is to make a business out of it. And the question is, I just had a copyright claim on one of my shorts. The music was chosen via the short self. Um, I had the option to dispute it, but I deleted the short. If it happens again, what should I do? Um, I would actually reach out to Team YouTube. If you're getting a copyright claim and that video was chosen via the short shelf in terms of you just embedded that, you know, song just directly from the shelf as you're uploading the video, um, then in that particular case, I would reach out to Team YouTube on, on X, um, formerly Twitter, and uh, see if they can help you get that resolved. I would also make sure that that copyright claim came from that song. Uh, yeah, you would have seen that. So yeah, yeah. Okay, I know a guy bicycles is the next uh, channel here. The type of channels hanging with the guy working on bicycles and cycling industry soap opera. The goal of the channel is to share my 30 plus years experience being in the cycling industry. And the question is, how many or little playlists should I have bike repair to option pieces? So if you are sharing your experience in the cycling industry, I'm going to guess that you are, you know, you mentioned here that you're working on bicycles and you're doing like a cycling industry type soap opera thing. Um, so because of that, if you're helping people like fix bikes, things like that, then, you know, putting those into playlists, maybe for the individual bikes or, you know, for the individual, you know, things that you're doing, like, you know, all the different ways to change tires and all the different rims. Like, I'm not sure really how much you have there with that. Um, but, but basically if you, it, here's what we want to think about when it comes to playlists. If somebody watches one video and it would make sense for them from after watching one to want to watch the other one, then in that particular case, you want to start adding those in the playlist in terms of how many you should have, you can use playlists for all kinds of different things. So, um, you can have playlists that you just categorize videos into where it's like, Hey, it's all of these, right? Like I do that on my channel page. I have one playlist that is my most recent videos on the channel. And I feature that on my channel page instead of my recent uploads playlist so that I can dictate the specific videos that are in there because I don't want my live streams. I don't want shorts, anything like that going in there. I just want to feature the content that's going to quickly add value to people as they're coming into the YouTube channel and introduce them to me and show them, you know, the, the, the regular stuff that I do. So, uh, so, you know, there's that. In addition to that, you also do have playlists that you can design for the purpose of putting them and adding them as sections to your homepage. Those can be different if you want them to be. In addition to that, um, you can make playlists for the purpose of directly linking them to your end screen. So in your case, let's say that you were working on a playlist for a specific mongoose bicycle. Then what you could do there is over time, let's say you, you know, change the tires on a mongoose bike uh, and you also change the tires on like a Cannondale and then you change the pedals on a mongoose and then you change the handlebars on that particular type of mongoose or whatever. As you start to do more things on that particular bike, then you can start putting those into that playlist. Then when you make any videos that would be that particular mongoose, mongoose bike, or mongoose bikes or, you know, something that would be relevant to that particular viewer, which would have a, that mongoose, then in that case, uh, link to that particular playlist from your end screen and from your pinned comment so that people that, and your video description, so that people that are riding that particular bike, they can go in and they can see all of those 
videos that are directly relevant to that specific bicycle. Because here's what I'm sure you're probably going to run into. You're probably going to run into people that will, like, let's say they come in on like a Cannondale video and it's something about, you know, changing the handlebars or something, even though the process is probably pretty much the same. They're going to be like, hey, why don't, you know, could you make one of these on, you know, this particular bike? <laughs> so if that's the case and you do run into that sort of thing, then as you start putting them together and you start making them relevant to the bike, then you can start always linking to those so that not only is it like, hey, here's how to fix all of the things about a bike, but it's how to fix all the things specific to this particular bike. Um, and then when it comes to the soap opera, um, if you do those uh, through like episodes or seasons, then putting each season as a playlist is another way that you can use them. Also, you can use them to link to from your community tab as well. So let's say that you are making a community post and in that community post, you're like, hey, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a cyclist, um, you know, these particular videos right here are the bare bones maintenance that you need to make sure that you, you know, keep up with on your on your bike. And then you put a playlist together that shares, you know, those bare bones maintenance things. And it might be three videos, it might be 10 videos, whatever, but you put that in your community tab. And then that way, the people that see that that are interested in it, they can go in there and watch that particular playlist. So you can customize them like per the action that you're taking. Um, you can customize them per, you know, the, the bikes that you're working on or the, the seasons that you're putting together, that kind of thing. You can use them in a bunch of different ways, but you get unlimited playlists. So you can use as many of them as you possibly want. Just when you're putting them together, always think about the viewer and think about if somebody were, was watching this one, what would they be most likely to watch next? And then, you know, start put building them in, them in the playlist that way. Hey, Roger, I don't know if you're still in here or not, um, but since you just swung in, uh, I got engaged, dude, uh, last week. So uh, just a heads up uh, there as well. So uh, let's see here. So next up on the list here, we've got uh, Bright Photoshop Tutorials. Um, they do bi-weekly content. Um, they do educational, they have an educational tutorial channel. The goal of the channel is helping others learn graphic design. Um, the question is, does YouTube keep getting um, updating? Does YouTube keeps updating Google AdSense tax info each year? So I recently got a notification on my AdSense account um, prompt about a new tax form. In terms of every year, um, I would say no. But in terms of, you know, if you get a prompt and they need to update something for the country that you're in or something like that, then absolutely, you know, make sure that you do that. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> I, I'm just kind of spreading, you know, spreading the, uh, the information there. Yeah, we went and did it in Japan. It was pretty cool. Next up, we've got Explore Norway. Uh, they do bi-weekly content. The type of channel is travel advice for traveling in Norway. The goal of the channel is to help tourists to have planning uh, their Norway journey. Help tourists planning their Norway journey. The question is, I'm posting links to my videos in different Facebook groups when answering people's question. This leads usually relatively uh, to a relatively lot of views. Some of my videos now have 50% traffic source from Facebook due to that. Is that good or bad? I mean, the video is exactly for the people who clicked on the link. So when it comes, uh, but coffee first, no, I haven't yet. I haven't said anything on Twitter or any other social media outlets. I just sent, you know, uh, after I did it, you know, I sent it to family. Um, and then uh, after that, you know, I have it for the live stream here. And then, uh, and then, you know, I might make a post on Twitter. I'm not sure yet um, because, you know, you know, why, <laughs> but, but I might, you know, I, I might, we'll, we'll see. But, uh, the, okay, here's what, we, here's what we want to think about. So yes, you have people coming in because you are answering their specific questions and they are in video form. So they are responding to that. You have a 50% traffic source from Facebook. What I want you to do next is I want you to go in and I want you to see how those people are responding to the content once they come in. So in order to find this, what you do is go into, you can see this at the channel level or you can see it at each individual video level. So you can start to see the questions that resonate the most so you kind of know what to share more than others. But uh, what you do is you go into your analytics. We'll do it at a specific video level. So pick a video that you shared go into your creator studio, go into your content tab, pick the video that you shared. Over on the left-hand side, if you're on a computer, click on uh, your analytics option. Once you have that page, um, click on advanced mode up in the top right-hand corner. 
then you are going to see a line of you know navigation going across kind of like the like the the top third of the page um within that you're going to see traffic sources click on traffic sources once you click on that um then you're going to see an option for external so if that is not highlighted change it from since published to lifetime or you know the other way around and once you do that, if it's not blue already, then it will turn blue and it'll have a line on it so you can actually click on it. So you wanna click into that external traffic source and then once you do that, uh, then you're going to see Facebook. From there, you can look over to the right-hand side. You can even add things to it too um, by clicking on the blue circle icon there that's in that table. But if you look over to the right-hand side, you're gonna see the um, average view duration. So what you wanna do is you wanna look there and you wanna see how much of your video that they're actually watching. And then that's gonna start to give you a idea of, okay, are they coming in and they're just like clicking on this and then they're getting out of there quickly or they come in and they're actually watching the whole thing. And you wanna use that information to give you an idea of how those links that you're sharing, how the videos are actually performing for those people. Um, because you know they could be coming in and they could be watching it for a real short amount of time and then they could be bailing or they could be coming in and they could be like, wow, this is exactly what I needed. I'm like sitting back with a coffee and, and watching this whole thing. Um, but I would definitely make sure that you are paying attention to how people respond. For anybody here, if you're sharing your content in any Facebook groups, subreddits, you know, anything like that, go into that same place, your, your external or traffic sources and then external and start seeing how people are responding when you do share it to those places. And that'll let you know if it's worth it or not. Because if people are watching for, you know, 30 seconds and heading out of there, it's not really doing you any good. Um, if they're watching for, you know, the entirety of your video or half of your video or something like that, then in that particular case, you know, it's 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 probably worth sharing there when, when you need to. Um, but you being a part of those groups though is the big win because then that lets you know the problems that people are having. And if you don't, have a video on it, then you can make a video when you do see those problems, if you share it into that group or not. Because if those people are having that problem, then other people are gonna be having those problems too, or have those questions, right? So when people are, yeah, and Roger mentioned right here, it could actually hurt you. Yeah, so like if uh, if people are coming in and they're bouncing like that, um, that's why you wanna look at that, at that uh, average view duration. If they do come in and they're bouncing that, uh, and they're bouncing off the page, then that can that can work against you. Um, the goal of the channel is education first. Oh, the name of the channel is Skunk Labs. They do daily content. The type of channel is e-commerce education. The goal of the channel is education first, marketing for our agency second. The question is, my channels, many channels in our niche, take a very clickbait type approach to their videos. We're more honest with the way that we do things and it seems to be hurting this. In fairness, we took a bit of break, but we have been going hot and heavy lately. I've noticed that lives get more juice. Are lives something that you think that we should push out more? Okay, so when it comes to making like clickbait and sensational titles, it works. Like people respond to that stuff. Like uh, it, it's just it's just how it is. That's why newspapers, or not newspapers, but that's why news agencies do it. That's why bloggers do it. That's why YouTubers do it. People respond to it. Um, I also, like I do it, but I, I try to back off sometimes. And same exact thing that, that happens to you when I back off, then you guys don't respond to it. So I'm like, okay, well, they're not responding to it. So now I gotta, you know, turn up the heat a little bit. And, um, and then I do it and then, you know, you start responding to it. So for whatever reason, you know, when you do take that approach, people respond to it as long as it's accurate, right? So you don't wanna just, you know, clickbait and like mislead people into clicking, but if you, click if you if you make the video exceptionally compelling and people click on it and then they get what they expected and then they're like wow this is great then in that particular case then you're you know essentially doing your job as a copywriter so to speak when you're writing your titles so uh yeah absolutely like those types of things they 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 work and that's why you know that's why that's why people do them but in terms of continuing that like in and going that route you know, that, that comes down to you. Like, uh, because people do respond well to it, it is tempting to do. That's why, you know, I do it too. Uh, but when it comes to doing that all of the time, sometimes it can kind of lose its luster, so to speak, for your regular viewers to where it's like, okay, well now, you know, they're just kind of, you know, going overboard here on this. And then they can start to get familiar with when you're overdoing it, right? 
Um, in terms of live streaming, if you have live streams and people are loving your live streams, if you enjoy streaming, give them what they want, right? That's the whole thing. Like, uh, you know, in addition to YouTube saying that their algorithm follows the audience, when you give your audience what it is that they want, they're going to keep coming back for more. So if they enjoy your live streams, then then definitely, you know, do do live streams for them as well as your video content that you're doing. Homesick Mac. Super chat. Thank you for the super chat. Super appreciate it. Thanks for the kind words. Glad that you're enjoying the content. Next up. Okay, so next up on the list here, we've got Mountain Life. Mountain Life does bi-weekly content. The type of channel is travel and events. The goal of the channel is to inform people about events and money. The question is, how can I determine the effectiveness of my thumbnails, which sometimes feel cluttered compared to others? Go and look at your click-through rate compared to the impressions that you're getting and make sure that you look at that in your traffic sources report in your advanced analytics. So in order to find this, same exact path that I, that I just explained, go into the video in question, log into your creator studio, go into the content area, click on the video in question, click in analytics, click in advanced mode up in the top right-hand side of the screen if you're on a computer, then go into your traffic sources report and then look at your click-through rate there compared to the impressions. And that's going to start telling you not only how effective your thumbnails are, but how effective your thumbnails are on the different pages of YouTube. And this gets really interesting because you're going to find out, like, wow, some videos people really respond to in suggested videos. Um, some videos people really respond to them on home pages. Some videos people only seem to respond to them in search. And you can start learning a lot about how people find your videos you can also use this as a way to look for fail, fail points in what it is that you're doing. So an example of this that I like to give is let's say that you go into your traffic sources report and you're like, man, uh, I noticed that when it comes to YouTube search, my click-through rate is fantastic compared to the impressions that I get. But when I'm on home pages and I'm looking, or just say, we'll just say browse or uh, uh, you know, in your traffic sources report, if I'm in browse, then in that particular case, uh, my click-through rate's extremely low for the impressions that I'm getting. What that tells you is that when people are actively looking for what it is that you're doing, that you're making that match, right? But when you are needing to grab people's attention when they're not expecting or looking for your content, then you are not doing a good job there. So then that's what you need to work on, right? And I've got, you know, I've, I've mentioned during this live stream also, like how to tap into that particular traffic source better. But the goal there would be if you're like, yeah, okay, that's where I'm, that's where I'm hurting is when you identify that, then you can identify where it is that you need to put time. So one thing I can tell you when it comes to home pages, the best thing you can do is just go simple, right? Simple with a very clear focus point. So, you know, if you use text or not, you know, that's up to you. I'd experiment and figure out what works best for who it is that you're trying to reach. But try to use, if you do, try to use as few words as humanly possible. Make the text very big, bold, and easy to read. But make sure that you do focus the viewer on a very specific thing that matters to them. So if it's a word that helps them quickly identify that that particular video is about that thing, that's fine. If it is an image... Like for example, you know, for the gamers in here, make sure that, you know, when you're making your gaming videos, use imagery that's big of the characters and things like that. If you're using them in your thumbnails anyway, pick a character, a couple of characters, and just make them really big in your thumbnail so that if, if your video thumbnail is really small and suggested videos, on a mobile, you'll, you'll most likely be fine unless it's on like your channel page. But if it's, uh, you know, like on a, uh, you know, on a computer and it's on a suggested video, then in that particular case, it's like, okay, this is pretty small. YouTube right now is doing some experiments on, on the layout. So we're going to see how that ends up working out with sizing. But the idea is to make sure that even at a small size, it's really easy for people to be able to identify, Hey, this is about this thing that I care about. So if it's gaming, as an example, it might be, you know, one of the characters faces um, or, you know, a crop that's something like this so that they're, you know, just it's crystal clear that it's about that particular game. Um, people also use game logos for this, you know, that kind of stuff. If you're doing, you know, crafting or something like that, making sure there's a clear focus and that it's crystal clear on that thing that you're building. And the exercise that you want to do is you want to say, OK, for the people that are into this because you're into it too. So for the people that are into this, what would help them be able to clearly and easily and quickly 
see if if they were just glancing on a home page against a bunch of other videos that it would be able to clearly help them see that this video has something to do with this type of crafting. Um, so like Little Crafty Nook, for example, should be doing like a big focus on the cards or other imagery that would help, you know, that would help that connection be made. Um, and the whole idea there is you're just trying to help people identify that it's about something that matters to them. That's it. That's it. And then once you get past that, then you can start, you know, experimenting with other things. But the the goal, especially when you're first trying to, you know, you're first learning how to get people to click on your stuff is like help, help them identify it. That's it. Um, and then from there, once they identify it, then they're going to be like, oh, I wonder what this is about. They're going to read the title. And then that is going to be your opportunity to compel them to click on the video through just being informative or being informative plus compelling. So next up, we've got Mountain Life. Love the channel name. Uh, the type of channel is travel and events. The goal of the channel is to inform people about events and money. The question is, how can I determine the effect? Oh, we did this one already. Okay. Next, we've got Mazzy Gamers GG. They do Minecraft, family-friendly, PG-13 channel, creative, safe, and friendly. The goal of the channel is I just want to have fun making videos and grow an audience, and maybe in the future I can make it a career next to my future art career and make money. Also, having another job could be a good idea for money-making. Question. Hey, Nick. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're doing great. Says, uh, been a while since I popped into a stream, but I'm back. Uh, my question is, how do I manage stuff in YouTube Studio, and what features help the most? How do I know if an editing style I have is working well and good enough for my viewers? I'm going to answer that one first. So the very first one is simply go into your audience retention reports and look and see how people are responding. For every video that you publish, for anybody here that's a new content creator, that's like you're just getting started with this. YouTube gives us statistics for our, our, our channel. Um, they're called YouTube analytics. And what those analytics do is they show us all kinds of different information about the people that are interacting with our content and how they're interacting with our content. So for example, you can see are people watching my videos a lot on TVs or are they watching them more on phones or are they watching them more on computers? That type of information helps you because if you notice people are watching it more on TVs, then in that particular case, you can make your, that's like an open, that's an open invitation to make really long videos. <laughs> people are watching on TVs. It's also a, uh, uh, an open invitation to make sure that you're publishing videos in like 4K and that kind of stuff so that you can create that better experience for those particular viewers. If you find that everybody's watching your videos on a mobile device. In that particular case, let's say that you're doing tutorials and you find out that people are watching your videos on mobile phones more than anything else by a significant amount. Then in that particular case, if you're doing a tutorial, instead of just showing the screen and not really zooming in or doing anything like that, then that tells you, okay, well, yes, even though they have the pinch and zoom feature on a mobile device, let me just make it easy for people so they don't have to do that. So that I'm going to zoom in for them when I'm highlighting a specific feature or showing them that next step that they need to take, right? So you you can use it for that type of information. Um, in addition to that, inside of your analytics, you also have the thing, which is your audience retention report, which is the thing that shows you second by second how people are responding to your videos on average. They now have information in there that shows you how subscribers respond compared to non-subscribers, new viewers compared to uh, non-viewers, or new viewers compared to regular viewers. Um, and this information also helps you better understand just how people are responding to your content in general. So if you want to figure out if your editing style is working, then you want to go into your audience retention reports for that so you can see how far people are making it into your videos so that you know the places that you need to work on and you can identify the things in your videos that are causing people to leave your videos. So you can use it for all kinds of different things like that. You can also use it to help you identify um, where the views are coming from for your videos on YouTube so that you can, you know, look for problem areas and you can lean into some of those depending on, you know, the type of content that you make. Um, you can also use it to see the effectiveness of the thumbnails that you're making as well through looking at your click-through rate information also. And your click-through rate, if you are a new content creator, that is basically how often people click your videos compared to how many times YouTube shows your videos to people. And when they show your videos to people, that's called an impression um, on YouTube. So you, your click-through rate is your click-throughs per impression. That's the information that you're going to see in there. But anyway, it says, I don't edit, but I'm thinking to edit. I want to start my channel now, um, and I'm a bit confused with features I don't have much knowledge of. Um, I hope I grow big on YouTube. I already have 35 from the previous subscribers. I've had for a while just having an extra channel or an existing channel I don't upload to 
and I'm wanting to do some recording and uploading, but I don't know what I'm doing. My channel was originally called something different and had a different description saying that I'll be doing multiplayer and single player on the channel, but I don't play single player as much. And now I'm worried I'll lose subscribers if some people don't watch or aren't interested in multiplayer or whatever the reason won't watch me. Okay, so here's the thing. Another part of, of being a content creator is you, you can't be afraid of what it is that you are, are, are getting into, right? If you are publishing videos, you're putting, you're putting content out into the internet and you want people to enjoy it. But when, when people are interacting with your content, the more people that are interacting with it, the less likelihood that you have that everyone is going to enjoy it. So you have to embrace that idea. You're gonna have people, even if you make amazing content, the people that make the best content on YouTube, they still get haters in their comments. They still get people talking about their production. They still get people talking about the decisions they make around the content that they're publishing. And they're making the best videos on YouTube. So for everybody else, embrace the idea that when you're publishing videos, you're not trying to please everybody. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make content for the people that are going to enjoy the content and be a part of what it is that you're doing. Those are the people that you're that you're serving, right? You're not serving everyone. You're serving those particular people. So um, just make sure that you embrace that idea. And when you do that, it kind of changes the way that you approach what it is that you're doing because you're like, okay, well, if that's the case, then I don't care if somebody, you know, leaves a comment, you know, that isn't, that's like, oh, hey, like in my case, I get comments or I, I just had uh, one, I can't remember, I think it was like today or maybe yesterday, um, I was in my comments and some some person came in, they're like, oh, the same tired advice or whatever. And I laughed because I went and I looked at their channel and they're not taking any of the advice, like they're not doing any of the stuff. So, uh, so for me, I'm like, okay, well, they're not taking the advice and doing anything with it. So they're not actually who I'm trying to reach anyway. So I don't care if they're in there and they're saying whatever it is they're saying, if they think it's the same tired advice, that's fine because they're not who I'm trying to reach anyway, because they're not taking the advice and actually doing anything with it anyway. So they're just watching the videos for entertainment, not to actually do something with the information. So because of that, I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, uh, whatever. But like when you are publishing content, you're, you're just not going to please everybody. So you just have to, you know, embrace that idea. Um, but in terms of, you know, being worried about losing the subscribers that you currently have, um, I've lost over 400,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel during the duration of time that I've been on YouTube, which is almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years in September. Um, I saw something, I think it was on his email list, uh, I believe, but Sean Cannell, who has almost 3 million subscribers over on his Think Media channel, uh, he's lost over 800,000 subscribers uh, during his journey on YouTube. So when it comes to that sort of thing also about losing subscribers, of course, you don't want to lose subscribers. You want people to enjoy your content. You want people to continually watch your content, but people moving on is just a normal thing of YouTube. People stop watching videos for a ton of different reasons. So also, when you see people leave your channel, take note. If you're like, hey, every time I make videos about this or every time I do this format, it causes people to leave, take note and then be like, okay, well, should I modify something? Should I keep doing that? Why am I doing that? You know, and just kind of reevaluate things. But just understand that that's part of the process. Rob the Mayor Timer says, how can you find out how many subscribers you've lost? Go into your uh, creator studio. Pin this up on the screen here really quick. Kev goes, super thanks for the super chat. chat. Thanks for the kind words. Says, great content this week, Nick. Thanks. Uh, or thanks. Great content this week, Nick. Uh, congrats to you and your fiance. Thank you. I was getting ahead of myself with the thanks there. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the uh, kind words. I appreciate it. Um, but uh, Rob the Maritimer says, um, how can you find out how many subscribers you've lost? So anybody that wants to see this, what you do is you go into your creator studio do this at the channel level. So go into your creator studio and then go directly over to your YouTube analytics over on the left-hand side. Um, click on that. Then you're gonna have that quick view page that initially pops up. Up in the top right-hand corner, you're gonna see an option that says advanced mode. Click on that. Once you click on that, then you want to change the date range because the default is the last 28 days. So you wanna change that date range to lifetime. Then you're going to see a table down at the very bottom that has a bunch of, you know, um, information in it. So you're going to look for a blue icon that has a little plus sign inside of it. Click on that. And then within that, you're going to see an option for subscribers lost. 
click on that and then one more column is going to pop up and in that column it's going to show you uh, how many subscribers you've lost in total and it's also going to show you the videos that people left to so you'll be able to see like on your video list there you're going to be able to see like oh this video lost this many subscribers this video lost this many subscribers and you're going to be able to start seeing that too but it'll show you the total and it's going to show you the uh, subscribers compared to the videos also Uh, let's see here next up and make sure that you set the date range to lifetime. Um, that's really important because then it shows like the entirety of your channel. Um, you can also do this on a monthly basis if you want and you're like, Hey, how many have I gained or how many have I lost, you know, there, but when you click on that, uh, when you click on that, uh, circle with the plus icon in the middle, there's a bunch of different things in there that you can add to that table to just help you better understand what's going on with your channel good and bad <laughs> so next channel we have here is a uh, spear uh, spiracy or spiracy they upload every other day i'm not sure which way to say that the type of channels documentary mystery and an unknown niche the goal of the channel is to grow a loyal audience if you're enjoying the show remember to give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend right now life and lucia says uh 803 lost over 10 years that's not really that bad, is it? No, that's great, actually. Uh, Life with Lucy and Glenn. Chantel says, 202 lost for me. They were uh, great instructions. All right, y'all, you made it in. <laughs> nice. Yeah, if, for any of you that looked at that, let me know how many you lost uh, for anybody here that looked at that. But um, on this channel here, the goal of the channel is to grow a loyal audience. And the question is, I'm struggling with the best storytelling format for documentaries. What is, in your opinion, the best format or maybe show me a format that can help me improve my script writing? So for this, um, documentaries have never been my, uh, my like specialty. So I'm really not the person to ask for that for documentaries. Um, I wish I could say like, oh, hey, just do this. But for documentaries, that's like, you know, much longer form content. It's not really my wheelhouse, so to speak. So I'm not the right person for that. Um, but one person that might be able to help with that is uh in terms of just studying what they're doing is uh james janney i think is the name of his channel um he publishes videos like every now and then and they all crush um patty galloway he's another one he does breakdowns on youtubers he was kind of one of the first people to start doing that and uh he also does like really long videos and basically tells the stories that these youtubers go through um you can go watch his as well that might also give some insight into because this is like a documentary per youtuber um so his might also give you know some really good insights into that structure but me myself i'm still working on storytelling um also like i, I hired a coach um to help me with that and to help me you know just better get into the nuance of storytelling because with what what it is that i do you know primarily with my content specifically um it doesn't really require as much you know of that so because of that um it's not something that i that i'm like super in tune with um so you know because of that i would check out uh james janney yeah roberto said he's probably lost enough to be at one million also we got Miss Bella Games lost 170. Um, Rob the Maritiner lost 532 over three years. Um, let's see here. What else do we got? Yeah, okay. So those went through. Yeah, me too, Roberto. Yeah, man, would definitely be there. Definitely be there too with you. Um, let's see here. So next up, we've got My Crochet Story. Um, they do daily content. Hey, another thing too, and I actually uh, listened to the audio book of this back on the storytelling question. Um, Mr. Beast recommends a book called uh, Save the Cat, I believe it is. Um, look into that too. Um, I, I listened to that and it was also really insightful on you know some of the details. I know Daryl Leaves in his uh, YouTube formula book. Uh, I got a link to that down in the description too. Um, he also goes into that a little bit, um, just kind of like a quick crash course on it. But uh, the Save the Cat though is uh, is really insightful in terms of you know storytelling and you know putting together the different parts of the you know script instead of looking at it like like you look at it like a whole story, but you actually kind of build it out in scripts. And there's very strict rules when it comes to Hollywood in terms of like you know specific things that you need to do at specific times in order for the story to work out and things like that. Really insightful uh, book. But yeah, it's called uh, Save the Cat. Uh, my Crochet Story, uh, they do daily content. The type of channel is crochet. 
The goal of the channel is provide crochet related content, tutorials, my designs, reviews of crochet related tools, books, etc. And the question is, except for my tutorials, which can be one hour plus, my other crochet related content hovers around 15 minutes. My question is, should I stick with specific content for each day? Um, Wednesday or should I upload randomly? Yeah, I, I would, if you're going to stick to a day, I wouldn't say that it's the day. The reason that I wouldn't say that it's the day in the video, like for example, if it was me, I wouldn't say like, hey, welcome to Mobile Monday. Um, if I said like, you know, hey, welcome to Mobile Madness, it would still be relevant, but I wouldn't say welcome to Mobile Monday. And the reason for that is because people are going to watch the video on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday also. So because of that, you just want to make sure that you're not doing anything that would kind of break the relevancy of that moment, right? So if I, if I was like, you know, hey, Monday Madness, yeah, that makes sense. Or, you know, mobile, uh, anything you could add to that that wouldn't stick a day on it <laughs> you know, would probably work. But, uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't do the uh, day thing. But personally, though, on your end as the creator, you can say, okay, Mondays, I'm going to do this. Tuesday, I'm going to do this. Wednesday, I'm going to do this. You can also do the same exact thing with your content um, that you're publishing to your channel. Monday, I do a video. Tuesday, I do a short. Wednesday, I do a live stream. Thursday, I do a short. Friday, I do a video. Um, Saturday, I do a community feed post. And uh, Sunday, I don't publish anything, right? You can do that kind of stuff too. Just to keep activity going. Or Sunday, I build out a playlist or, you know, something like that. So Figure Fever is our next channel here. They upload one time per week or more. Been on YouTube for a year or more. The type of channel is toy hunting, toy reviews. The goal of the channel is to share my content to others across the country. And the question is, my channel is currently under 200 subscribers. Someone on Instagram told me that he couldn't find my video under a certain phrase and topic. Example, toy hunting in Massachusetts. Um, I checked as well and other videos come up, but these individuals are not at that state or mentioned it. Is there something I can do that help YouTube suggest my channel, please? So when it comes to YouTube suggesting your content, it is going to be 100% dependent on how people are responding to your content on the platform. If you publish videos and you can't get people to click on them um, at a competitive rate and you can't get people to enjoy the content at a rate that's competitive against the other content that they're showing the, the people that they're showing your content to, then in that particular case, they're going to prioritize the content that is getting that response. So if you want to have YouTube you know, recommend your content more, then you have to, you know, because you're, you're just getting started. You have 200, you know, subscribers on your channel. So what you need to do now is you need to start working on, okay, how are people responding to what it is that I'm doing? How can I make better videos? How When I start my videos, how can I grab people's attention? How can I assure them that what it is that they clicked on is what it is that they're going to be getting in this video? Um, you know, those types of things is what you should be working on now in order to you know, facilitate that positive experience for the people that are interacting with your content. And when you do that and you start making videos that they respond to at a more competitive rate, then YouTube is going to start, you know, suggesting your channel more or your videos more. Now, if somebody looked for your channel, like, okay, so when it comes to search, if they're looking for your video under a certain phrase or topic, then in that particular case, you need to make sure that you also, YouTube is smart enough technically that they do show videos in search that do not have what I'm getting ready to tell you. But most of the time, when you look for something, uh, very high percentage of the time, when you look for something, um, those videos have very specific words and or phrases that are related to the search query, the search term or the search phrase. So the default filter on YouTube search is relevance. So YouTube specifically says add keywords and phrases to your titles and video descriptions that describe the video. And part of that, when it comes to search ranking, I just mentioned this in my last video, make sure that you watch the video that I, that I just published, uh, the last one on my channel before I went to Japan or while I was in Japan, actually. But basically the idea is that when you add those words and phrases to your video, it helps give the system context. Again, the system get, starts to get an idea through the things you say in your video, the things that you're showing in your video of what your video is about. It'll test it on different pages of YouTube and where people respond to it the best. You'll end up getting the most traffic from, where they respond the least, you'll end up getting no traffic from or the lower amount of traffic from. So if your videos are not showing up when people are look putting in those words, doesn't matter where they're from, doesn't matter any of that stuff. What matters is if they've optimized the video for that, and people are responding to it when they are searching for those particular things. 
that's what causes the videos there. Because just like on a homepage to where if you publish something and people are responding to it there, YouTube will keep showing it to people. Same exact thing applies to YouTube search. If people aren't clicking on your video and watching that and enjoying that video and getting satisfied from that result, then in that particular case, they're going to start prioritizing the content that does give them that uh, you know satisfactory result from their search. So, uh, so that's probably what's going on. If they're looking for your channel and they can't find it, in that particular case, make sure because your description on your About Me page is also considered when it comes to that sort of thing. So make sure that you do, you know, mention your channel name and talk about what your channel's about and all those types of things also on your About Me page, um, because those things can also help, you know, when it comes to search. Uh, trying to think, yeah, that should uh, do the trick for that question. Hey, Roberto Blake also mentioned uh, Study Dodford. If you are interested in documentaries and James Janney, um, he says that he's worked with James Janney uh, in the past. So next up, we've got Escapement uh, and Watch. They upload one time per week or more. They've been on YouTube for a year or more. The type of channel um, is Watch Reviews. The goal of the channel is a side hustle. The question is, congrats, Nick, on the engagement. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, says, does a short count as a real upload to stay consistent? It never says congrats on your latest upload for shorts, different algo algorithms, wondering if missing a week of long form and just putting up a short will help keep my recommendations up. So um, in that particular case, if you're missing a week, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, when it comes to shorts, it is like a different thing, so to speak. So because of that, it's not a way to kind of fill the gap. I mean, yes, if you look in your real time views, you will see it reflected there. But in terms of like, hey, I'm trying to, you know, get this short so that I can, you know, make sure that YouTube keeps recommending my content to people. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it that way. Instead, I would look at it as, okay, YouTube shorts are something that you can make that you can reach people that might not have found your content otherwise. Out of all the people that are going to see that, some of them are going to be a great fit for your channel. A lot of them are not. So because of that, you might get a lot of views on those. However, the amount of people that are actually going to subscribe and then watch your long form, depending on your content type, you might have a lot. Um, you might have none or a very small amount. So when it comes to YouTube shorts, look at them like they are something different because they are. Um, yes, it's all coming from your same channel, but it's a, it's a different outlet. Those viewers can cross over and YouTube will recommend some of your long form content to them. And some of those people will respond to the long form content, but keep in mind, um, it, it's a different thing. So because of that, um, instead of doing that, um, I mean, do that too, right? But uh, if you're wanting to take advantage of the short shelf and getting in front of people that might not have clicked on one of your videos, Definitely, you know, it's great for that. But when it comes to uh, your long form content, I wouldn't put something up just for the sake of, you know, kind of keeping it going. Uh, one thing that you could do, because it, it's only a week, right? If you're like, hey, I'm going to be gone for like three months and I need to figure something out. In that case, I would recommend like, okay, um, you know, try to batch produce, you know, a few videos, kind of stagger the uploads, you know, like if you typically do once a week, do once every two weeks instead, just, to, you know, kind of keep, you know, plug in the system to keep giving your viewers content that they want from you, that kind of stuff. But um, in this particular case, I would just, I wouldn't worry about it. Just come back and spend extra time on that next video that you're putting together to uh, try to make that as good as you can. Oop, no, not doing cough anymore. I'm actually gonna swap these out here. There we go. Uh, let's see here. So uh, next up, we've got uh, Denalid, Texas. Denalid, Texas does gaming content. And hey, really quick here. I haven't done this yet for this live stream. So I'm going to go ahead and smash this out now just because I got it in here. And I usually we don't do these as much in my uh, when my brother's streaming with me. So I'm going to go ahead and hit this real quick. Hit the sub button. Hit the like button. If you're having fun, comment, type something. If you're laying back, lean and then engage. Just take a second to smash the whole page. All right, there we go. Okay, so next up, we've got Donald uh, TX. They upload when they have time. It's a gaming channel. The goal of the channel is to make clean content that people like watching. 
The question is, how do you find the right way to present a live slash pre-recorded event? This is a common and first look gaming content, um, but could apply to any live footage. So if you are doing a, like, do you mean that you're wanting to upload a video that you made? In that particular case, you can load it up into StreamYard or any of your, you know, whatever it is that you stream with um, as a source or, you know, something like that, or do what I just did there with the video um, where you just click on it and then it'll play. Um, if you mean that you are wanting to download something, like let's say that Apple is like, hey, we have this event, um, or uh, uh, Rockstar Games is like, hey, we've got you know this GTA footage, you're wanting to download that and use that. Um, technically, you can use some of that stuff within fair use, but in other cases, you can't. And if you do fair use, you have to do it exactly right. Oh, structuring the narrative for something that you can't plan. Got it. Yeah, for that, um, yeah, I would try to, I would just try, man, that's tough. So if you're doing a live stream and you're trying to structure it for something that you can't plan, then I would do it around an update. I would, I would, I would package the whole thing around an update and around the event. Like, hey, this event is happening. We don't know what's, you know, what's going on, um, you know, breaking, you know, whatever, that type of thing. Um, yeah, I would do something like that so that it's more general and it's about the thing, but it, it's not super clear on exactly what it is that that you're going to be discussing. So it's like, hey, you know, this this game is coming out or they've just released this or whatever. So it's like, you know, breaking, uh, you know, Rockstar releases, you know, new GTA 6, you know, whatever. Um, um, or, you know, breaking huge rock star, you know, announcement, something like that, and then basically build it around that. Journey Life Vlogger, thank you. Hey, and really quick, uh, Roberto Blake also came in and uh, mentioned that uh, George Blackman has the best information on script writing. Uh, you can also find him on X um, as well. Follow him over there. He also shares some good like tips and stuff over there too. Next question that we have is from, I'm trying to get the word from D here. I, I'm pretty sure they're, they're streaming over there. They're supposed to be, but I'm trying to get the word from him to confirm one way or the other um, so that I kind of know what to do here. But I'm not sure if 100% if they are, but I think so. I'm just trying to get the official word here so I know to like let you guys know about it or not because I already have the redirect set up, but I'm going to change it real quick if they're if they're not streaming over there, but I think they are. Yeah, I see it's scheduled. But I'm not 100% sure if it's if it's uh if it's going down or not. I think so. Okay. So uh and usually when they do also like Dana will usually pop in here also so let me send this to him. And you guys streaming. Because if they're not, I also want to uh, update my redirect too before, before that. Okay, so uh, next up on our list here, we've got uh, Have Fun Cooking. It's the name of the channel. The type of channel is a cooking channel. The goal of the channel is to share my food creations and recipes. And the, okay, they are. Okay, cool, cool. Um, it says, I just started making thumbnails and I wanted to know, do I post thumbnails with shorts and videos? So when it comes to thumbnails, you cannot do custom short or custom thumbnails on shorts. You can only do screen grabs. Yeah, so so today, so um, Kadu, uh Ribeiro, I hope I'm saying that right. I apologize if not. Says uh, we have Daryl today at noon as well. Yeah, I've got links to both of them down in my video description. So we've got uh, my brother and Daniel on channel reviews over on the Streamyard YouTube channel. It's like a game show, super fun. And then we have uh, Daryl Leaves also going live talking about how one of his students went from I think it's like fifty to five hundred thousand subscribers or something like that. It's it's like you know like he gets like crazy results over there in, in his uh, channel jumpstart program so he all, always has like really cool uh you know information to share there but uh, uh but his is talking about that which i think a lot of you might also get a lot of value out of 
Um, so, you know, this redirect is going to go there, but I have links to both of them down in my video description. So you can pop them open, you know, figure out, you know, what's the best fit for you um, if you want to keep your uh, YouTube related education going uh, for today. So uh, next up on our list here, we've got uh, Learn Spanish World. They do educational content. The goal of the channel is to provide a wide range of Spanish lessons and videos, provide value to my community while I work hard to hit 200,000 subscribers. Um, the question is, says, congratulations on your engagement, amigo. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Says, um, can I use the same footage in two different channels as long as I modify the content and target a totally different audience? Absolutely. Um, I created a new channel, but it's in a totally different niche. I want to use some of the footage that I use in Learn Spanish World, but in a totally different context, different sound effects, music, different editing style, absolutely all day long. So when it comes to that, um, think of it like this, like, you know, how they have stock footage sites. So stock footage sites, people download footage from there and use it across all different genres and you know, all different, you know, types of content. There's some things like I have personal not personal that, you know, that I've made, I've got that stuff too. I call it me roll <laughs> instead of B roll, but, uh, but I have a folder of me roll that I'll, you know, reuse, uh, uh, you know, a decent amount. Uh, in addition to that, I have like a, a, like a core group of things. Like, you know, if I'm talking about views and I have like the view counter, you know, so the same stuff, you know, a lot of other people use from like story blocks and all that. But, uh, but yeah, you can absolutely, you know, use, you know, reuse footage that you've used in the past. Absolutely especially if it's going in for like, you know, different context or, or a different, you know, experience. Absolutely. Uh, next up, we've got uh, mom socially working. They upload when they have time. Uh, so really quick, Tina Timblay Embroidery Sewing and Quilting says that um, they do not have the subscribers lost, that it is crossed out. So uh, one thing, I'm just going to pull up your channel real quick. Now you got 1.6 thousand subscribers. So yeah, you've probably lost some too. Uh, make sure that your date range is set to lifetime. Um, if you didn't do that already, because technically it should be, uh, it should be showing up in there. So yeah, make sure it's set to lifetime. Uh, let's see here. So next up. Yeah, Tiffany. Yeah, the, the me roll thing. Yeah, I was that just kind of uh, like happened when I was building that folder. I was like, what am I going to call this so I can like easily find it? And I was like, oh, it's B roll is what I use it for. So I'll just call it me roll. <laughs> uh, the corny never stops, right? The corny never stops. Okay, so uh, mom socially working. They do education mostly, says, I eventually want to transition to vlogs and day in the life. So the goal of the channel is to create a stream of income and teach people about this field that I'm passionate about, also to grow a fan base and promote my other businesses. The question is, do you think it's smart to upload social work vlogs, tips for low-income families, and advice for social workers on the same channel? I want to do all of this, but I don't want to confuse the algorithm. So um, if you are doing tips for low-income families and advice for social workers, just those by themselves are, would be a no-go. Um, and the reason for that is because the low-income families that are trying to fix that problem, they're going to have a whole different set of things that they're going to care about compared to social workers that are working a very specific jobs and trying to help people solve those problems, right? So because of that, yeah, I would definitely separate that content. Um, the the whole idea that that you want to think about is – when, and, and everybody, you know, should think about this is when you're putting your channel together and you're deciding what content that you want to make for it, because everybody has different, you know, things that they're passionate about. Everybody has different things that they want to share. Um, everybody, you know, has just different interests, different hobbies, you know, things like that. And all of it would make for good content. But when it comes to your channel, you're building a resource for a certain type of content for a certain type of viewer. So through that, one of the things to think about is when, when you're trying to, you know, answer questions like this is if somebody were to watch, like, let's say the social worker um, person, if they're, if they were to watch a video on the tips that you were giving them about social work, their social work job, and then the next video that YouTube recommended to them was about some tip for low income families in that particular case, that's not a, that doesn't directly resonate with the social worker. I mean, there might be a little bit of crossover there because, you know, they are trying to help, you know, in some cases, you know, low income families. So there might be a little bit of crossover there. But um, uh, if you're doing like the, 
social up like if you're doing the social work vlogs and then tips for social workers i would say that would be in more of an alignment because then what you're doing is you start to create this resource for social workers right and then when it comes to the tips for low-income families you create a resource for low-income families so it's two totally different audiences for that content and another thing is when you start uploading your social work vlogs with the advice for social workers you might also find it's really easy to get people to come in here for the tips information but when i do a vlog it's different because that's more of you know it's more about me yes it's showing behind the scenes yes it's showing insight but it's more about me and the life that i'm living which can still be interesting to them but it's not there's not like a direct clear value from the outside in terms of the packaging right in terms of the thumbnail and title so because of that you would essentially be using like the tips content for social workers to introduce them to you and let them know that you're also going through the experiences that they are and then through that they might find your vlogs and then be like, oh yeah, well, I wonder if they're having the same experience that I am and things like that. But you'll quickly be able to figure out like, okay, are people, you know, responding to both of these or not? And if not, then you can, you know, kind of pick whichever one that they're responding to. Um, but yeah, in terms of the channels, I would definitely um, separate the tips for low income families away from the tips for social workers. Next up, we got Yassine Khalik. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I apologize um, if, if I'm not. They upload every other day. The type of content is self-improvement. The goal of the channel is to build a community. The question is, I'm going to go super niche and focus on building confidence. Will my previous content affect the results of new content? Well, no. Um, every video that you publish on YouTube kind of stands on its own merit. So if people really respond to uh, you know, your new videos, then, you know, YouTube will keep showing those videos to people. If people res are still responding to your old videos, then YouTube's going to keep showing those old videos to people too. But in terms of if you put out a bunch of bad videos, is YouTube going to punish you in your next video? No, because most content creators, they start by putting out a bunch of bad videos, right? Um, so they start by putting out bad videos and then they get a little bit better and then they start getting a little bit more views and a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And then they hit that competitive threshold to where it's like, okay, now I can compete. And then they start getting more views on what it is that they're doing. So that's just a normal part of the process. Um, so yeah, don't, don't be discouraged by any bad content that you've had that's underperformed, but what you do want to start thinking about since you are doing self-improvement content is try to make sure that you know everything that you're putting on the channel is about self-improvement in some way uh, so that if somebody watches one video on self-improvement it would make sense for them to watch the other videos that you've published recently too next up we've got jess book girl tv and by the way we're like 39 questions in so we're doing great today uh, they upload when they have time the type of channel is a booktube channel the goal of the channel says, I love doing it for fun. The question is, when you use the community tab and put hashtags in there, does it get your channel out there for people who are not subscribers? How does that work? So with your community posts, um, your subscribers will see them, some of your subscribers and some people that are not subscribed. You actually get stats on your community tab, so you can see if any of them generated subscribers to your YouTube channel as well, which is interesting. Um, but when it comes to that, like the hashtags, it's not going to really make a difference there. Um, but there are like when it comes to your community tab, just make sure that you are being intentional when you're using it. So for example, if you're gonna ask questions, try to make sure that your questions are catered towards the audience that you're trying to serve with your content, which is people that are you know, into books. When you are doing polls, make sure those polls are relevant to people that are into books. When you are sharing photos, things like that, make sure that it would be something of interest to those people that you're trying to reach. But in terms of like, you know, hashtags in there, you can add them, but it's not going to necessarily make a, you know, make a, make a, a difference on like pushing that, uh, that, that post out. Project Frugal is our next channel. They upload one time per week or more. The type of channel is frugal living. The goal of the channel is financial independence and frugal living. The question is, um, are longer descriptions more effective than just covering shorter information? So YouTube uses your description as context for your videos when it's deciding who to show your content to. So the system is, is really smart, but it does help when you give it more information. So, you know, for example, if I say, uh, you know, um, 
to get more views on your videos, make great thumbnails, right? It gives you information and it's like, okay, well, I know that I need to make good thumbnails, but that's going to be a different thing than if I'm like, okay, to make good thumbnails, here's what you need to do. You need to make your, you know, text big and bold and easy to read. If it's something that you're using text for, um, you want to make sure you have a clear focus point. You want to make sure that you're not adding uh, a clear thing that you're trying to get the viewers that you're trying to reach to focus on to help them identify that it's about something they care about. Um, you need to make sure that you're not adding anything to the thumbnail that would distract them from that clear focus point. And I start giving you very, you know, uh, clear information on how to make a better thumbnail. Then you get more information from that. And you're like, okay, well now I could actually go and make a better thumbnail versus him just saying make better thumbnails. Right? So when it comes to your description, it's one of those things to where when you are, when you are giving their system more information, it just has more to work with. So yes, the system's looking at your video. It's, it's monitoring what it is that you say um, and all of that. Like it, it gets an understanding of what your video is about and it will show it to, you know, the right people or it's likely to show it to the right people. But when you're like, okay, now let me fill out, fill out an entire video description, not an entire video description, but let me add a lot to the description that gives more information about what this video is about, then it's also going to take that information into context for who it is that it's going to show that content to. So it's going to just add more to the data set essentially that it has for it, for their recommendation system to make the best recommendation to the viewers that are the best fit for that content. Next up, we've got Colorful Tales. Colorful Tales uploads one time per week or more. They've been on YouTube for a year or more. Um, they do indie and colorful makeup content. The goal is getting monetized. And the question is, congrats on getting engaged. Thank you. Um, says, not enough videos are available online about how to manage old content offline. By this, I mean how to store it, file it. I think Roberto Blake has a video on this. Um, how to store it, file it, and organize and pre and post process videos, music, photos, graphics, GIFs, etc. Um, it takes lots of space to keep the old videos and finding things from the past if needed. I've used external drives so far, but I'm thinking about upgrading. Any suggestions or advice would be amazing. So for me, I still do um, like like backed up external hard drives as well. Um, the reason I do that is just for mobility. They're small, easy storage, all of that. I've considered getting like a RAID system um, to where, you know, you got like, you know, six or 12 hard drives in there or whatever. But in my particular case, I don't, you know, even really reuse the footage. Um, but I know a lot of like vloggers and, you know, uh, people that make that type of content. And what they do is they will usually have like RAID systems and all of that. And there'll be large capacity drives that they put in there and they do that so that they can archive everything. Um, they usually will have a general folder for like locations and things like that. And then when it comes to the video, they will have everything for that video contained inside of a folder for that video. Um, I have a, a, a live stream that I've done on the TubeBuddy YouTube channel. Um, I did this several years ago where I show my structure and everything. But basically the idea is that you have like the root for the video. And then within that you have music, you know, uh, photos or B-roll. Um, you have graphics, you have any video graphics that you've added. So in addition to just the general graphics that you use, if you have any branded graphics, anything like that, then you can add a folder there, or you can have that up in the higher root folder to where basically everything would reference, you know, those graphics. You can just pull that in as a separate thing if you needed to in an archive later. Um, but some people will just go ahead and put those into, you know, the, that main project folder. Um, and then if you have like scripts, anything like that, you put that in there, you put your um, uh, PSD, you know, your Photoshop files or any images that you use for your thumbnail inside of the thumbnail folder. With that, you can, um, for me, it would be the PSD listed out. And then within there, it'd be photos if there's any photos that I used for that. Um, yeah, sound effects, all that stuff. And basically, you just include all of that um, in that structure. And then that basically makes a self-contained uh, project so that you can take that project and open it up at any time and all the folders, you know, if you're like, hey, it can't find this, then you find it once in that particular folder and then everything else will kind of stack into place. Monique says that um, they got a 40 terabyte um, NAS. I'd rather have and not need it than need it and don't have it. Plus I've published over a hundred books. Yeah. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff, right? It, it just depends on what it is that you're doing. Like um, for example, on my all our questions channel um, that I have, that I haven't uploaded to in a really long time. 
on that particular channel. Um, I actually, you know, saved that content, and I, I save the videos that I make now. But I, but I don't. Don't mind me, just doing whoops. my nails when I look good for the show. But I don't. <laughs> but I don't really uh, use them. So I've considered putting that content up on the TikTok as well. And if I do, you know, I'll re-edit it or have it re-edited. Um, if that ends up happening, then that folder structure that I just described is going to be a lifesaver for me. But uh, if I had continued that channel, then um, then I would have, you know, also, you know, tons of hard drives and all that stuff taken up from that. So, all right. On that note, I do want to let you know, um, if you are a new content creator, I just want to drop the reminder in here really quick that if you are a new content creator um, and you're just getting started and you're like, man, I, I, I'm, I'm doing everything that I can, but it's just not working out for me right now. Um, I do want to remind you that uh, this stuff, you know, takes, it, it takes time. If you work on your skill sets, it's going to get you there faster. Um, when it comes to YouTube, there are not shortcuts. Like you have to, you know, walk through the fire, so to speak. You got to learn how to do the thing. And, you know, for some people, they can learn that quickly. Some people, they know it innately. Some in terms of, you know, like how to put stuff together and knowing what good is and how to identify good. And when they're putting something together, they can be like, yeah, that's good. And, the, and it's actually legitimately good. Um, but just embrace the process and just identify that like, hey, I'm in a learning curve right now. And the better that my skill sets get and the better that my understanding gets, the better my channel is going to do. Um, so because of that, make sure that you're continually working on those things. And also be patient because this is hard and you're competing against some of the best content creators on the planet because your videos are going to show up right next to Mr. Beast. Your videos are going to show up next to all of the content creators that, you know, you watch for some, you know, audiences. So you are going to be showing up right next to the best creators on planet earth. So because of that, just embrace that and be patient with what it is that you're doing. Be really clear about why it is that you're doing this and what it is that you're trying to achieve so you can make sure that you're tracking the right things and working towards the right things and um, and stay at it. And um, on that note, I do want to let you know that I have two links down on my video description. And in addition to that, as soon as I end this stream right here, it's going to redirect you to the channel review live stream that my brother and Daniel Batal are doing right now. Um, if you want to get feedback on your YouTube channel, go over to that stream. Um, if you want to see how somebody went from 50 subscribers to 500,000 subscribers, Daryl Eves is also live right now, I believe, as well. And uh, on his channel, he also shares, you know, tons of great information about that as well. So pick whatever's, you know, best for you if you want to continue your education about all this. But I have a, a direct link to uh, both of them down in the video description, as well as a bunch of other helpful tools and resources as well. So make sure to check out all of that stuff um, on your way out. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend. I hope that you got some type of value out of this stream. Hit the like button on your way out. And um, I will see you next Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern with my brother, D, um, where we will be also answering your YouTube questions just like we did today. Have a great rest of your weekend, and I'll see you next time.